Hello, son and daughters. You all ready for some goosebumps? It's old Texas scare, and I'm about to share a story so frightful it'll make your heart race. So saddle up and grab a swig of sarsaparilla, because we're in for one heck of a scary ride. This would have happened in the late 90s. My dad and I decided to duck hunt a marsh not too far from the town he lived in. It was a good spot and late in the season, so we got there real early to get a good spot. As I remember it, nobody else was there, so we walk in a couple hundred yards and proceed tossing out decks in the dark. We weren't talking initially, but both noted the lack of sound coming from the refuge, which we know is loaded with ducks and geese. There is a smaller marsh straight south, about two miles, and birds generally fly between the two places in the morning. As we were finishing with decoys, I noticed a point of light going in a huge square pattern off in the distance. I figure above that other marsh, pointed it out to my dad, and said, Why would someone be up lighting fireworks today? At 4 a.m.? We kind of shrugged, but continued to watch it. This light was like a sparkler in the dark. It was a point of light changing color from blue to yellow to green and had a kind of trailing effect like someone writing a letter with a sparkler in the dark. Then it switched to doing a triangle shape and changing from red to pink to purple. It sped up and continued doing this for what seemed like forever, but was probably no more than a minute or two. Then it just got dark again. We just kind of said that was weird and went to grass in a couple spots on shore. We get sat down to wait for daylight and notice off in the horizon to our east, the entire horizon had a similar point of light, alternating the reddish colors, then the bluish colors, then back again. It would light up and shut off, then move to another spot and flash and so on and so on to make a checkerboard pattern. It was doing this at a crazy speed and working its way back and forth to the west and toward us. It moved faster and faster until it was seemingly just across the pond and it suddenly stopped. It was completely dark for a second and then it was like a super bright flash of white light lit up the whole world like an asteroid and flew over our head from east to west. Never made a sound the entire time. The weird thing about this whole story is that, at the time, we didn't really say anything to each other. It was weird to say the least. You'd think we would have been talking about it. In fact, we never said a thing about it, even though I still think about it. Until a couple years ago, after a few drinks on Christmas, we both recall it the same way, and both find it weird how nonchalantly we acted after it. I have no idea what that was. I didn't see a ship or aliens or something. It definitely wasn't Northern Lights. I have seen those, but I, I can't explain it. My name is Tom, and I'm a park ranger at Yosemite National Park. It's my job to protect the park's wildlife and ensure that visitors follow the rules. But when I stumbled upon evidence of illegal hunting in the woods, I knew that something was seriously wrong. I followed the trail of broken branches and disturbed underbrush and soon discovered a group of hunters huddled around a map. They were talking in hushed tones, and I couldn't make out what they were saying. But when they noticed me standing there, they quickly packed up their gear and tried to make a run for it. I managed to catch up with them and demanded to see what they were hunting. At first, they were hesitant to show me, but eventually they revealed that they were tracking Bigfoot. I was shocked. I knew that hunting was forbidden, but Bigfoot, are they messing with me or are they high? In any case, I decided to play their game and I tell them that Bigfoot hunting was strictly forbidden in the park, and I told the hunters that they needed to leave immediately, but they didn't listen. They were determined to catch the creature and make a fortune selling it to the highest bidder. For the next few days, I tried to keep an eye on the hunters, but they were crafty. They moved through the woods quickly and quietly, leaving no trace behind. And then, one day, they disappeared entirely. I searched the area for any signs of them, but they were nowhere to be seen. It was as if they had vanished into thin air. If they found Bigfoot, I guess that creature eaten them.
As a park ranger, I thought I had seen everything the woods had to offer. But that was before I stumbled upon the artifact. It was buried deep in the woods, buried beneath a pile of leaves and twigs. I almost missed it, but something about the way it glinted in the sunlight caught my eye. I dug it up with my bare hands, and as soon as I held it in my grasp, I knew that it was something special. It was a strange device, with a series of buttons and knobs that I had never seen before. But as I examined it more closely, I started to realize that it was attracting something, something dangerous. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but as I walked through the woods, I could feel a presence behind me, watching my every move. It was like a predator stalking its prey. I tried to shake the feeling, but it only grew stronger, and then it attacked me. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. It was fast and agile, with razor-sharp teeth and claws. It moved through the woods with lightning speed, and I could barely keep up. I tried to defend myself, but my gun was no match for the creature's speed and agility. It seemed to be drawn to the artifact, and it wouldn't stop until it had taken it back. As I ran through the woods, I realized that I was hopelessly outmatched. The predator was faster, stronger, and more determined than I could have ever imagined. And as it closed in on me, I knew that my time was running out. But then something strange happened. The artifact in my hand started to glow, and the predator recoiled in fear. It was like the device had some kind of power over the creature, something that it couldn't resist. I took my chance and ran, running as fast as I could through the woods. I didn't look back, but I could feel the predator's presence behind me growing weaker with each passing moment. When I finally made it back to the ranger station, I was shaken and confused. I had never encountered anything like that before, and I had no idea what to do next. But I knew one thing for sure. The artifact was dangerous and I couldn't let it fall into the wrong hands. I locked it away in a secure location, knowing that it would always be a threat lurking in the shadows of the woods. And to this day, I can still feel the predator's presence stalking me from the depths of the forest. I know that I got lucky that I narrowly escaped with my life, but I also know that there are things out there that we can't explain things that we may never fully understand and that terrifies me more than anything this incident occurred in memphis tennessee i started my career as a memphis police officer a few years previously in the 1980s i was on a special assignment at the time it was 2 a.m and it was a clear summer night but quite humid I was in my personal vehicle with the top down and the radio playing. I was still in my uniform, including my bulletproof vest and a gun belt with all the regular equipment attached to it. I was heading south on Covington Pike at a good rate of speed and was the only one on the road. This part of the road connects the Raleigh-Bartlett area to the Burr-Clair area. The road is slightly elevated as the surrounding area is low and running through it. It is the Wolf River, which is a few miles from here and connects to the Mississippi River. This area is commonly referred to by the locals as the Wolf River Bottoms these days. As I was driving in my peripheral vision over to my right just outside my headlight beams, I noticed something was moving fast directly toward the front of my car. I immediately slammed on the brakes, thinking that a deer was running across the road. But I couldn't have been more wrong. It came to a screeching halt right in the middle of the road, right in front of my headlights, not more than seven feet from my bumper. As we both froze in place, staring at each other for several seconds, it appeared to be three to four feet tall, but was also crouched. It could have been closer to five if it stood straight up, but I got the impression that its current body posture was its normal way of standing. It had a large head, at least compared to its skinny, slender body. It appeared to be dark gray and greenish in color, similar to the color of an alligator, but the appearance of its skin looked like a similar texture to a human. It had dark, large, oval eyes on each side of the upper part of its face, running slanted from the top portion of its head to about the midsection of its head. It was kind of pointing inward to where you would expect a nose to be. However, from what I could tell, there was no distinct nose. At least none 
like a human. Below the eyes was a very thin, dark, almost black line, which I assumed was its mouth. It ran from about the same location a human's mouth would be, however. The line ran straight across the lower face in front, and then turned upward and slightly back on the head. It had no ears it could see. Its body and chest area were rounded like a human, but vastly smaller, almost like a child's. Its arms appeared to be longer and somewhat disproportionate to its body, and they were skinny and had an insect-type look to them. I could make out hands, but they were also completely folded at the wrist joint. The legs were long because even with this thing's shortness, I could make out the top of them, even with it so close to the bumper, which was obscuring the bottom half somewhat. They were like the arms, thin and insect-like, but appeared to be jointed. I did notice its chest area moving slightly like it was breathing, but it seemed slow and steady. I never noticed anything like genitalia. There was no hair any place that I could see, and I'm not even sure if it was wearing any type of clothing. If it was, it would have had to be skin tight. I never noticed a tail at any point. My adrenaline was pumping, and it was only a brief period of observation. It again took off like a shot, and it was out of my headlights. I could still make out its outline in the darkness, and it was moving like a sprinter. It leaped over the guardrail onto the other side of the road and down the embankment. I will admit that this was not the only bizarre incident that I had during my career, but it definitely was the strangest. I never told anyone on the force about the encounter. In fact, I only mentioned it to a close friend during these many years. I can only identify it as a lizard man or an unknown humanoid. I would have never believed it unless I actually witnessed it. We were walking around Dawn's elk ranch. Then all of a sudden, all of the elk started running around frantically. Me and my friend thought it was a cougar or something. We sat there for 20 minutes at least. Every one of the elk were looking back at where they came from, which I thought was really weird. Then all of a sudden, I swear to God I saw it. I swear to God, Bigfoot, it was a hairy ape man looking thing. It was about eight to eight, six foot tall very muscular and walked on its hind legs. It was walking in a fast pace like it needed to be somewhere in a hurry. I grabbed my shotgun and shot two in the air. It ran straight for the brush and we never seen it again. The smell of the thing smelt like Hennessy garbage and shit mixed together. When I fired the first shot it picked up a big rock and flung it at us. Too bad we were 100 yards away. He came pretty close to hitting us. That's when I laid down the law. I piped another shell and laid it right on him. That's when he took off. That's when last I seen of him or her. I used to work on Vandenberg Air Force Base in Central California. My office was on top of the mountain that was ceremonial to my land. Whenever ground was broken, we had to have a religious leader come out and bless the ground first. It's usually pretty foggy about halfway up the mountain, and I got used to driving it every day, but you have to keep an eye out for deer, mountain lions, bears, all sorts of wildlife, one night at about 11 p.m. I was driving down the mountain and had just gotten to the point that the fog was gone. In front of me was clear, and behind was just a wall of fog. As I got to a sharp turn, I saw what I thought was a large coyote in the road, so I slammed on my brakes. It looked like it had no fur and was covered in pale leathery skin, with a dog-like head. As I looked at it, it rose up on its hind legs. It was hunched over it maybe six feet tall. But if it was standing straight, I'd guess seven feet. It turned and looked right at me and slowly walked off the road into the brush. At the time, I was doing a class about Native Americans for my degree and was in touch with Chumash members. For my project, I asked them if they knew anything about it, and they simply said, we don't talk about that. To this day, I'm 100% sure I saw a skinwalker that night.
That sound brought one of my brothers into the house to alert the rest of the family to come hear this. We went outside and stood in the driveway and heard the most frightening guttural roar you can imagine. This accompanied the pounding on the wood object. This lasted several minutes. The evening was clear, warm, and without wind. I do not remember a moon. Neither brother could explain what was happening, and I recall being scared out of my wits. When the sound subsided, the family returned inside. The incident was not discussed in front of me again. As a child, I was privileged to live in this remote, beautiful area and be allowed to run free. Sometime later, a boyfriend and I observed what we were told must have been a bear in a thicket of alder trees near the house. The feces found there later contained crawdad shells and berry seeds with a horrible odor. But the creature we saw was not a bear. The hard, dry ground showed no tracks. Our fathers were loggers and we were well versed in the local wildlife. While this all happened a very long time ago, I still get cold chills remembering those sounds. Years later, my fiancé and I were driving north on Oregon Highway 101 near Cape Perpetua, north of Florence, Oregon. The highway was narrow, two lane with the Pacific Ocean on the west and steep rock cliffs on the east. I was watching the moon over the ocean turn sidewise facing the ocean. A very large black creature rose from a cliff in the cliff and towered over the little car we were in. My fiancé yelled, What the hell was that? I only caught a glimpse of the thing through my peripheral vision, but it was huge and very fast. I suppose we surprised it as much as it surprised us. It terrified me. My fiancé searched for a place to turn around as he wanted to go back, and I refused to let him. We were armed with what suddenly seemed to be a very small weapon, considering the size of the creature. When we returned home, my fiancé told his father about the encounter. His father told us of the rancher at the foot of the capes, also on Highway 101, who had been riding to check on his cattle when he heard a cow bellowing in agony. His horse became nervous, but he forced it on and found a very large hairy animal chewing on the live cow. He carried a thirty-six rifle and shot the creature. It stood up and ran off on two legs. He followed until he lost a trail of blood in the rocky terrain. This is the first time I have ever heard of someone shooting and wounding one of these creatures. It is also the first time I have heard of this creature eating the meat of any animal. Our encounter was in the late evening with clear skies and a full moon. My fiancé saw the creature in the headlights and had a great view of it. He knew it was not a bear, and didn't think it was a human in a pursuit. Facial features did not have a snout, and the arms were too long for a bear's front legs. I was too terrified to grasp any features. I've never felt fear like that before or since. In late spring, I went for an overnight hike up Ice House Canyon on Mount Baldy, east of Los Angeles, with my girlfriend. We set up camp a few miles in, and a snowstorm hit that night, and it just kept snowing for two days and nights. We weren't prepared at all for snow, so we decided to wait it out in a small two-person tent for two extra days and nights. It ended up dropping a little under four feet of snow, and the trail was just gone. So we packed it up and started wandering down the mountain. It was slow going and rough because we didn't bring enough warm clothing and were soaked to the bone. About two miles down, we made it to the canyon floor and started following the creek. But then we noticed mountain lion tracks crossing the trail in the freshly fallen snow. We had about three miles to go, so kept moving. The whole way down, we kept seeing those mountain lion tracks crossing back and forth across the trail, but never saw the beast. We knew it was watching us. It was scary as hell. We made it back to the car and were met by a ranger. Our car had been the only one in the lot for the last couple of days, and they were growing concerned, who confirmed there was indeed a mountain lion in the area. Ah, the sweet bliss of stripping down and warming up in that car. I'll never forget that little overnight trip. In 
It was March 4th, around 7, 7.30 p.m., driving home in south-central Iowa. Going eastward, I saw a light not unlike a cell phone tower, but of a more orange-scarlet color, unlike any cell tower. Unlike any cell tower, in confusion and mild unsettlement, my mother and I watched it move and slowly flew away. As we further went to its direction, we stopped at a gas station for a quick bite to eat. And as we left, we noticed something abnormal, low-laying fog and a scent like burning metal. As we left and got into our car and began to further drive home, the smell of once burning metal morphed into a vile sulfuric smell, and then quickly changes to a pungent, mold-like scent that made our nostrils, eyes, and lungs itch and burn. So much we ended up wearing face masks in the car. And for an hour or two after, we faced lightheadedness and muscle fatigue. At first, we suspected a manufacturing plant was having difficulties. But two weeks later, no new information has shown up. Just a coincidence or something more. Most of my childhood, I lived in a farmland area in southeastern Idaho with a population of 400 people. Over the years, you would hear of the spooky crap that haunts the farmers out in the fields, and there is two that stick out. One is of a Native American, was an actual dude that lifted a sprinkler pipe into a telephone line and died back in the 80s. And the other was of a strangely almost seaweed-type covered monster that would run with a spud truck in the early hours of spud truck in the early hours of spud harvest. Anyways, years later, I moved away, but only 15 minutes away, so I was able to keep my up with my friends there and visited regularly. One night in the summer, while driving out to see them, it was around 2 a.m., and it was pitch black out. I was speeding on a long, windy road that I always take, and when I took a bend to my passenger side, I saw what I heard as a kid. The straggly-looking monster was right there on the side of the road. It looked straight at me with its white eyes and black pupils as I stared back at it. I was going at least 70, and as I passed the monster, it sprints with my car. It was at least seven feet tall, and it was just keeping pace with my car. I went up to 90 and he's still just right next to me, sprinting while I was shitting myself. After a mile of this, the thing veers back off into the pitch black. Got to my friend's house and I don't think I slept that night. Four years have passed since then and haven't seen it. But I still get creeped the F up when I take that bend at night. I was hunting our family farm in Wyoming. I stayed in the stand until last light and was walking back to the house. Neither mom or dad were home that night. I walk up the driveway and put my bow in the truck and start unbuckling my safety harness when I hear something strange up in the pasture behind the barn. I finish taking my harness off and walk up behind the barn and I hear the sound again. It almost sounded like one of the neighbor's young cows got stuck in the fence. I didn't think anything of it and I still had my El Chapo Walmart headlamp on, so I start walking up the hill to go see what was going on. I got about three-fourths of the way up, and I heard one of the most deepest coyotes howls of my life, let out, followed by the rest of a pack. I'd say three-four total. I swear every hair on my body stood on end, and that shock of adrenaline ripped through me in my butt, headed back to the house to get a gun and a better light. I went back up there, but never against my better judgment, but didn't find anything. If I had to guess, though, I'd say those coyotes had one of the younger cows cornered, and they dispersed when they saw a herd of guy in camouflage beating feet at Usain Bolt speed down the hill to the house. I've heard that coyote with a deep howl a few times since then. Even had him howl back at me once. Never could get eyes on him, though, in person. So I'm not new to seeing the hat man, but something happened a few weeks ago that really disturbed me. I've seen that man since I was a child. Not consistently, but every once in a while. I have always been terrified of him, but I got to accept him more as I've grown up 26 female. He would sometimes talk to me, very briefly, and 
it was always like he was waiting for something. But a few weeks ago, I had been sick, and right before I went to bed, I saw him again. Usually, I would always see him as I was falling asleep or waking up. I tried to blame sleep paralysis for a long time. This time, I was fully awake. There he was, just standing there in the corner of my room. I was scared, but I've gotten used to him, so I didn't totally freak out. But then he sort of pointed his finger, and suddenly a woman appeared. A fully colored woman. She was in her late thirties to early forties, wearing a blue hoodie and with shortish red hair. She smiled at me and reached out her hand, and all of a sudden I realized that she had come there to take me away, because I was dying. I was so sure of this. There wasn't a doubt in my mind. I hate the thought of dying. I refused to go with her. I looked back at the shadow man, almost pleading with him. Then the woman moved closer to me, still with an outstretched hand, and I knew it was time. I suddenly felt really defiant and then screamed at the woman at the top of my lungs. She vanished, and I was left standing in my room, shaking. My whole family heard me scream and came running. They found me shaking with a fever. I ate something, drank something, and took a fever reducer and then went back to bed. But I can't help but feel like the hat man sent a ghost to me to harvest my soul, because he knew he always scares the crap out of me. So I'm telling my mom what I saw, not about the hat man, but about the ghost, and she tells my grandma. And apparently the last owner of the house fit my description perfectly. She even wore a blue hoodie all the time. I had no idea about this beforehand, so I was shocked. She died in the house at a relatively young age, and I didn't find her body until it was already starting to decompose. So I'm not new to seeing the hat man, but something happened a few weeks ago that really disturbed me. I've seen hat man since I was a child. Not consistently, but every once in a while. I have always been terrified of him, but I got to accept him more as I've grown up. Twenty-six female. He would sometimes talk to me, very briefly, and... It was always like he was waiting for something. It was grayish or white, and it happened in Iron River, Michigan, Mineral Hills, where I was born and raised. Also, there was talk of alien abduction in the 70s, 80s, where I'm not discounting this has happened to myself or my family. It was like 11 p.m., or... Midnight in 1997 or 1998, and it was not a large owl. It was far bigger. We were about to drive down a hill, and there it was out of nowhere, like it swooped down in front of the car. I want to say from one wing to the end of the next, likely eight, ten feet wide. We both screamed, and it flew into the darkness to our old mining ground. It's almost like it came from behind us and then swooped in front of our vehicle. All I can say is that it seemed whitish gray, and I'm not sure about the legs or feet. All I know is it was like a human, like body, and then a humongous wingspan, far larger than an owl. It is just like if my husband, who is six foot one, would be flying and have a huge wingspan. When asked by the investigator if she had previously had any encounters, the witness stated that she had not. The witness then stated that a friend of hers had reminded her that they had another encounter, approximately two weeks after the initial encounter. My friend reminded me there was a second time within weeks of that first encounter. It was flying above our old village hall, again late at night, and immediately flew out of sight. We were almost at her house, and she screamed, saying, There it is again, then flew off. Both were very fast encounters we never investigated further. I was hiking in the Cascades in Willamette National Forest, Oregon. It was a remote area of the range. On the seventh day of my hike, the hair on the back of my neck started to stand up. I chalked it up to be a mountain lion in the area, but the weird thing was the uneasy feeling never left. That night I set up camp, planning to stay put for a few days. That is when I heard the strange howling. It wasn't wolves or bears or any other animal I'd ever heard. The closest thing I could relate it to is the noises primates make. This persisted for the next few nights. 
Something started rummaging through my campsite soon after. I assumed it was a bear or raccoon. But then on the ninth day, I woke up and my food bag was removed from the tree. Something had cut the line through. All my food was gone. I decided to break camp and push forward. I had a few days left until the end of the trail. I could always fish for food. The same nightly activities occurred on the eleventh night. By that time, I was sure that I was being followed. Something started throwing rocks at my tent. For some reason, I lost it. I screamed into the darkness for whatever it was to leave me alone. Hoping it was just some person fucking with me and maybe they'd leave me the hell alone. Instead, it grew quiet for the first time in nights. Nothing could be heard. Then a scream, louder and more vicious than any other night, cut through the silence. Then nothing, complete and utter silence again. Despite it being quiet, I wasn't able to sleep that night. I just waited. The next day, I continued my hike, dead tired, just wanting to get out, the hair on the back of my neck still standing, and the forest was still quiet. I felt like I was being hunted. Towards the end of the day, I sat down to rest before pushing a few more miles when I saw it. Something tall and large, bigger than any man or animal I had seen, sliding through the forest, not making a noise. I yelled at it. It turned to look at me. I never got a good look at it through the trees and the brush, and it was dark. I threw a rock at it and then pulled my knife. This thing just kept staring at me. I don't know what kicked in, but I no longer felt scared. Damn it! I was angry and I bluffed, charged at the thing. It stepped back a few steps, then stopped. I yelled again. This time it took off running to my left. It had long strides and was quite agile. I was very tired and made camp there. A night of silence. When I woke up the next day, I knew that I had about ten miles until the end of the trail. Exhausted, hungry, and mentally drained, I made my way out. As I got closer and closer to the end of the trail, the typical forest noises returned. I no longer had this feeling of unease. I got to the trail's end and sat in my car. I was an emotional wreck. I believe that I was stalked by a Sasquatch, but I just don't know. I told a park ranger about it, and he jokingly said they have a bunch of Sasquatch sightings in the area, but most likely it was my own imagination. I still do a lot of long hikes, but that trip was by far the worst. I've always loved the forest. It's where I feel most at home. That's why I became a park ranger, to protect and preserve these lands. But one day, something strange happened. I was walking along the forest trail, keeping an eye on things like I usually do, when I saw a group of men in black suits walking towards me. They had no park ranger uniforms, but they had badges and ID cards that identified them as some kind of government agents. They said they were conducting a routine investigation and asked me to show them around. At first, I didn't think much of it. I figured they were just here to check on the animals or the trees or something like that. But as I watched them work, something about their behavior started to bother me. They were searching for something, something elusive, something unknown. And they weren't telling me what it was. I asked them what they were looking for, and they told me it was just a routine check. But I knew they were lying. They were hiding something sinister, and I was determined to find out what it was. One night I decided to follow them. They were searching for something deep in the woods, something that made my blood run cold. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. A low growl, almost like an animal, but something more, something inhuman. I confronted them, demanding to know what they were doing. That's when they turned on me. They threatened me with jail time if I didn't back off. They said I was interfering with a government investigation and that I had no right to be here. But I couldn't back down. I couldn't let them find whatever it was they were looking for. So I kept following them, watching them from the shadows. As the days went on, their behavior grew more and more erratic. They stopped sleeping, stopped eating, stopped doing anything but searching for that thing in the woods. And as they got closer, I could feel something dark and sinister looming over us something that had been sleeping for far too long. Finally, one night, they found it. I don't know what it was, but it was huge, with eyes that glowed like fire in the dark. 
They tried to catch it to contain it, but it was too powerful. It broke free from their grasp, and chaos erupted. I ran as fast as I could, but I could hear their screams echoing through the forest, a sound that still haunts me to this day. I don't know what they unleashed, but I know it was something far beyond our understanding, something that should have stayed hidden in the darkness. Now I'm afraid to go back to the forest. I can't shake the feeling that something is watching me, waiting for me, and I know that those men in black they were hiding something that should never have been found. Something that will haunt me forever. During 2019, I ran my own ride service. Think of Lyft or Uber. Not a promotion. That's what I did. I did not work for either of those companies. I did this on my own, independently, as a means to get some extra money on the side. Now that I look back on it, it was totally more of a social experiment than anything. I had presented myself and my vehicle information to all of the local police departments, as with the state police of my area, as so they knew who I was, if I seemed suspicious. Driving around late at night in the different areas, they were on board with it, and so was I, and I began this short stint of a positive public service. That's where this begins. Aside from the occasional troublesome passenger, nothing out of the norm really happened. You know the saying, they only come out at night. This is very much true. I began this experiment. In the late summer of 2018 and by February 2019, I was definitely deciding on putting an end to it. I don't remember the specific day, but it was mid-February and after 2 a.m. It was very cold, if not at or below freezing. I was finishing up a route that typically consisted of those needing a ride home from a night at the bar. I didn't have many passengers that night, so I decided to wrap it up and head home. I was leaving a neighboring town that's only about two miles from my own, sitting at a stoplight in an intersection when this sudden impulse to take an alternate way home came over. A road that cut up over a hill through the woods and semicircled back to the same highway had I not gone that direction in the first place. I was tired, yet I debated with myself as to whether or not I should. I didn't have long until the light would turn green, and finally I said expletive it. I chose to take the road that went straight instead of the usual one to the left. Why not? I do like a good little adventure now and then. There is where I made my mistake to a degree. I crossed the highway and went up the hill, and I hadn't driven very far until I was met by a pair of glowing greenish-yellow eyes. First thought, dear. Naturally, I stopped. I was no more than thirty feet from it when panic began to set in. It wasn't a deer. Whatever it was, it was lying on its side, looking up the hill. It turned its head to look at me, and that's when I thought it to be a large dog instead of a deer. It was solid black in color, and then it proceeded to sit up on its haunches very much like how a person would. At that point, I truthfully believed it to be some species of ape or large monkey. Let's pause. Whatever this thing was, it was very difficult to determine its shape, despite the fact that my high beams were shining directly on it. It wasn't that it was amorphous. It was to the fact that it was blacker than the black of night. When it sat up on its haunches, it continued to alter its focus from looking up the hill to looking toward my car, back and forth like I caught it by surprise. It then stood up on two feet when I got the best view of it. It was approximately six feet tall, built and shaped in every way a human man is. Head, neck, shoulders, arms, hands, torso, legs, and feet. It had no distinguishing features other than it looked like a living silhouette or a person dressed in nothing but a solid one-piece black spandex bodysuit. I knew it couldn't be the latter for what person would wear that in the freezing cold of mid-February. Don't answer that. There was no texture to its appearance, no hair, no horns, no fur, just the blacker-than-night silhouette-like shape with the two glowing greenish-yellow eyes. It made no sound whatsoever, but looked as if it was deciding on what it wanted to do since my sudden arrival to where it was. I saw this thing for a grand total of what I will guess to be between one and two minutes. 
It stood frozen in its stance before suddenly turning to the right, walking and stepping over a guard rail into the woods. My heart was racing. I was mortified. Despite this, I summoned the courage to drive to the very spot where it had been standing, one foot on the brake, the other on the gas. I rolled down my passenger side window to see if I would see it again, or hear it, or smell anything. Nothing. Not even the crack of a fallen branch or underbrush. Needless to say, I didn't stay there very long. I punched it up over the hill, covering all about an additional 100 feet when I met by a second set of reflective eyes. Another expletive, I'm sure. I'm trapped. Either this thing has circled around to being in front of me again, or there's more than one. I know I'm not going to be the next one taken to my death, dragged off somewhere in the woods never to be seen again, so I give the gas pedal another punch. I'll either hit or run this thing over, or die trying. I come to a sudden stop in my realization that the second pair of reflective eyes is actually a person. A man roughly my age wearing glasses, toting a large laundry bag and basket. Quickly I roll my passenger window down again and give the man a rather fast-paced explanation of who I am, what I do, and why he should enter my vehicle. Sir, I don't mean to alarm you. My name is X. I offer rides for people who need them. The local police already know about me. This is not a trick or an attack. I'm not going to hurt you. But you are not safe right now. You need to get in my car immediately. Something to that effect, but spoken a lot faster than what you can probably read it. Without question, he nodded yes. I unlocked my doors. He loaded his laundry into the back seat, and we were off. After he was in my car, I proceeded to tell him what I'd just seen moments before. He lost the color in his face, but was on the complete level of understanding the situation. He went on to tell me that he had finished doing his laundry, though I don't know what laundromat closes that late, and that he was walking to his home that wasn't far from where we were. He asked me what I saw a second time, and after listening he calmly offered that it could have been Bigfoot. I told him I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, it was watching him, staying him. That's when it sank into both of us. Had I not listened to my impulse to take another way home, who knows what that thing may have done to him on the dark wooded road. The rest of the ride was silent. I dropped him off at his house. He unloaded his laundry and thanked me. He offered me some money for the ride, but I, I declined it. I knew it wasn't right for me to take it considering what had happened. We parted ways and I returned to my own home very much confused as to what I witnessed. Since then, people have told me I've seen a shadow man figure, a demon, a skinwalker, a slender man, a rake, a crawler, or an alien. More times than not, I still get the possible idea that it could have been a Sasquatch or juvenile Sasquatch. I don't know. But I will go on to include that if I personally believed it to be one, knowing full well what one is with all of the descriptions that entail. I would state that I thought it was a Bigfoot. I sometimes still take that road, even though that happened four years ago, almost daring myself if I will or won't see that creature again. Thought I would share my story. Myself and a bunch of buddies went camping for four days up near Steamboat, but below, about 35 miles away from Oak Ridge, we camp at this spot up in the middle of nowhere. It's a nice stop, close to the river and open for our campers. We camp with dogs. Well, everything was nice and cool until myself and a friend took our quads down river on some trails. Park then started catching some nice natives. And you know, once you start fishing, you always want to move downstream, so I did that. Came up to a kind of log jam, where huge logs and sticks were in the stream at once time but left a sandbar with a little creek. As I was preparing to jump down over the creek onto the sand, I noticed a track, and it was bigger than mine. I am six feet eight with a size 15 shoe. This was about 19 inches. I measured it. I was like, what the F, and scared at the same time. This wasn't normal. There were five tracks about three to park. Then my hair on my head stared to raise. It gets worse. 
I walk back up the hill to the trails to tell my friend and write as I get on the trail. I hear thug thug, kinda like when you stomp on the ground. I started walking faster. Never look back and we don't camp that far up in the wild anymore. We go to like Hills Creek Campground. Lola felt I was in his area and he wanted me to leave by the thug's noises. I was so scared this kind of stuff never happens to people, only in books and movies. DHA security guard in Salt Lake City, Utah, reported directly to me that on the early morning of August 8, 2010, he was patrolling an area in downtown Salt Lake in an area where there is a target under construction. When around 1.20 a.m. he saw a strange figure walking on all fours with long arms and pale skin. Stunned, he went looking for his flashlight. When he looked back, it had vanished. He had been moving his patrol vehicle to the other side of the site and saw the strange creature when he was getting ready to park. He further described the strange figure as having pale gray skin with bumps, and it walked on its hands, which had to be as long as his legs. Its head was of an abnormal shape, and it didn't turn to look at the witness, so he didn't see the face. It didn't appear to have any hair on its body, and it had no clothing. He reportedly found strange handprints where he had seen it, but didn't have a cam with him at the time. He didn't hear any noises, but later heard noises on the roof, as if someone was walking around on the roof. Additional, the witness estimated that the creature must have been at least seven, eight feet in height. He could make out its spines and rib through its skin, but the arms appeared to be muscular. Tonight was one of the scariest things I've witnessed, and I just don't know how to explain it. It's my second incident with the same thing, but this was far scarier than the first. So the first incident I didn't think much about because it was last April Fool's Day when husband and I were driving home from a friend's ranch. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flash of white as our lights illuminated something by the side of the road in the adjoining field. It looked like a stark white naked man, but it was running on hands and feet like an animal, going very fast and parallel to our car, but the opposite direction. We both saw it and were creeped out, but hell, it's April Fools, and we're in the middle of nowhere, rural Montana. People get bored and do stupid things and like to take opportunities to spook people. Halloween gets crazy here. So we figured some guy playing a prank. Then tonight happened. I went down the road to where the mailboxes for our street are. It's that rural road delivery setup where you have about 20 mailboxes at the end of the long country road. It's about 200 yards from our house and the moon's out, so I figure I'll walk over and check the mail, see if husband picked it up. When I get there, I find a neighbor not too far from our front door, heading the same way on a walk, so we started talking, and she accompanies me to the mailboxes. I take a peek in the box. Nothing. We continue chatting for a few minutes. Then suddenly, there's barking from several of the neighborhood dogs across from us. One at a time, they start furiously snarly and barking, a few of them howling. My neighbor mentions that there must be coyotes rolling around again. Happens all the time, nothing to worry about. Then one of the dogs starts howling in pain, almost screaming kind of, something's not right, and we look at each other thinking the same thing. Time to nope out of there. We start walking back a bit briskly when she turns to glance over her shoulder for a second and stops. I turned around and see it as well. It looked like a rather skinnyish but stone white man, but not a man, on his feet and hands like an animal. No hair that I could see. The light from my phone got him in the eyes for a second, and they shone for a second, like a cat. There was blood down the front of his jaws. It all happened in maybe two seconds. Three, very fast. Then he bolted after us, and we ran as well. My neighbor doesn't chain or fence in her dog as we're animal lovers ourselves and like having the extra protection from him wandering as well. So she starts yelling out the dog's name and he comes running out from his spot between our houses. 
He must have smelled this thing or heard it coming because he made a beeline past us, growling and snarling like crazy. We reached my husband's woodworking shed first, so we hid him there, and I locked the doors and windows while she called the cops. All we could do was wait and hide in the shed while she told the cops to come out, hearing her dog barking and attacking whatever the thing was. After a couple minutes, she was off the phone, and we were hiding behind boxes of stuff away from the windows. I don't know how long we were there before she whispered that the dog isn't barking anymore. He wasn't making any noises at all. A few moments after that, we heard crunching from outside. Something started scratching slow and hard against the front door and part of the wall next to it. I'm not too proud to admit that I pissed myself a little bit and had to throw my hands over my mouth to keep from screaming. She was staring at the door, not moving, so I know I wasn't overreacting or going hysterical for nothing. It seemed like forever, but eventually we saw the lights from the cops coming up the long road and the scratching stopped. Whatever it was ran off, cause we heard the noise of leaves crunching hard and fast, away from the door. She was the brave one with the guts to peek out the window to wave at the cops when they got close enough. When they got near, we ran out to the cop cars and told them we saw something Kinderman who chased us. She pointed out the direction we had gone and ran back, mentioned the sounds of the dogs in the opposite neighborhood a few yards from the mailboxes. She said how her dog came to help us, and we hid in the shed. The cop taking our statement said that someone else had called a few minutes before she did and said there was a wolf or something in their backyard that killed some chickens, and their dog and the neighbor down from her saw this thing too. The other cop found my neighbor's dog laying on the ground with what looks like deep claw wounds, and he was having trouble breathing. As he was helping to bundle up the dog to let the vet come out to pick him up, he mentioned how it looked almost like a bear attack, but what we were describing wasn't a bear. So here I'll give a description of both what the neighbor down from the owner of the dead dog described and what we saw. The neighbor said it looked like a stark white naked man, quite tall, wearing the skin of a bear or bison, brown furred and head attached, blood coming from his mouth and front of his chest very long arms. She caught him crouching over the dead dog, turned on the back porch light, and he stood stunned for a few seconds before running off. What we saw was a pale white man without hair, naked and with long arms. Eyes glowed like a cat for a split second in my flash of light, reddish glow, skinny. When he started running after us, it wasn't awkward like a guy trying to run on his hands and feet. It was like a person, but not a person, on his hands and feet, but very much in control of his movements, like an animal. This isn't the first time this kind of thing has happened. It's not the first time I've heard of odd things. Montana is one of those kinds of places where many odd and unexplainable things live and happen. We're mostly a mix of huge forest land, mountains, and open plains. Lots of places for things you don't normally expect to see can hide around here. But it's the first time something odd has come after me in the dark. It's been a couple of hours, and I'm still shaking. I called my best friend, and she mentioned posting it here because she's heard about some of these Reddit forums from YouTube videos. We're not the only ones seeing things like this, and she thought someone here might be able to help figure this whole thing out. Thanks in advance. This story goes back probably when I had between 10 or 12 years old. I can't describe if it was either a paranormal experience or an alien experience, however. When I told this to my sister, she told me she experienced the same thing. I couldn't sleep and I was watching Adventure Time before midnight. I can't remember the episode, however. Something was off when suddenly the signal changed to a scene. A background of three humanoid-shaped black silhouettes standing on top of a hill on the screen, while behind them some strobe-like red. Lights and black stripes were flashing rapidly, swapping positions with each other, looking like sun rays or the flag of the Japanese Empire. This went on for about ten seconds or so, and a very unsettling sound was playing in the background. It was almost like a shepherd tone. 
I was petrified and confused on whatever the hell I'd just witnessed, since this was never aired on the original episode, and what kind of signal capturing interruption was going on because it was short and didn't mean anything. It was very odd. I felt very uncomfortable and terrified for a moment. About thirty seconds pass, and behind my window's curtains, I see bright but dim green light pass by. It was almost like if a car's headlight passed by, but it was no car since my room is on the second floor, and in front of my window, there are roofs and no cars obviously, but that light passing behind my window was as fast as a moving vehicle. Thirty seconds later, my whole room began to shake violently up and down like a very strong vibration, and I couldn't sleep after an hour because I couldn't process what just happened. It's been almost ten years, and I'm telling this to my older sister detail by detail, and she got goosebumps after I finished, because she told me. She had the same experience, however, an entity came to visit her. She was very lucid and said out loud, Is this real? Is this really happening? What is happening? She described this entity to me as looking like the little girl from the movie The Ring, and she responded to her saying, Yes, it is, and you don't have to be afraid, and went away. She couldn't sleep for an hour and began to cry after that hour passed. That's my story. I'll try to post the pictures of some drawings trying to recreate the event. What did I see? A couple of weeks ago, on the western side of Wisconsin, along a gravel road that was lightly wooded, I saw a shaded figure walking nonchalantly across the road into the woods, almost perfectly invisible except for when it passed a tree on the edge of the road. Between the whiteness of the freshly fallen snow and the dark bark of the tree, I would have completely missed it, unfortunately, for whatever it is. The shadow turned darker than the tree bark and was more pronounced against it. I passed by at that point and have been thinking about it ever since. This encounter occurred on my family's property about 20 years ago. It is 15 miles east of Greenwood, Mississippi. During deer bile season, I had a nice food plot set up in the woods about a half mile from the nearest house. These small plots gave the deer something to eat and an easy escape route to the trees. It made them feel comfortable. I had a tree stand set up on the edge of the field. After being in the stand for about 15 minutes, I see what I think is a large Labrador retriever enter the opposite end of my food plot, heading towards me. As it approached, I quickly realized that it wasn't a dog. It was a black panther. The paws were massive. I was amazed and scared at the same time. I was already in a standing position. It approached my stand, so I drew back when it got close to the base of my tree. When I drew it, looked up at me, but it never stopped moving as it passed my position. I decided not to shoot because I thought that I stood a better chance of getting out of there alive by leaving it be rather than potentially wounding a deadly predator. I also recall that my grandfather had told my uncles that the big cats were there many years ago. This cat was about seven feet long. That's a body length of approximately five feet. It showed no fear of me and almost acted like it knew me. I had hunted in those woods since I was a young teen. I stayed in the stand until it was dark, and then I got down. I thought that would be best for me to follow the panther's route to ensure that he was gone. So I walked about fifty yards on the trail that I saw him follow. Then in the glow of my flashlight, I saw green eyes shine, and then his head extended out from behind an oak tree. I stopped and notched an arrow, then stepped backward until I made it up to the open field that was on top of the hill. I put my arrow back in the quiver and ran half a mile to my truck. I took a day off during the week to do some turkey hunting. I got a late start, but I had a good idea of where I needed to go for a late morning hunt. I set my turkey decoys up in an opening that had two trails running perpendicular to my position. I sat in a corner and against a large oak tree. I chilled for a few minutes to see if anything would sound off. It tried an owl call. Immediately an owl called back just a short distance in front of me, and then another to my left. 
The responding calls were too loud and from two separate animals. This was not an owl. It was something mimicking an owl, and it was something with big lungs. I packed my gear and headed for the truck. This hunt was over. The next winter, I took my son and uncle in there for a quick squirrel hunt. My son was little, but I wanted to get him exposed to the woods. We started hearing trees being pushed over in the distance. I asked my uncle what he thought it was. He didn't have a clue, and then we got the hell out of there. Again, this hunt was over, too. I did some research after those events, and I learned that others had posted sightings of Bigfoot creatures and similar behavior on the Mississippi Bigfoot page. I never saw the creature, but I'm certain that something... Okay, so this happened two and a half years ago. I was living with my horribly abusive ex, every way except physical and sexual, and his family had a building in the back of the yard that me and him lived in. I should begin this by saying there was a lot of negative and evil energies and entities that fed on and encouraged the chaos in the home, and within all of us who lived there. While I lived there, I often felt people watching me or directly behind me who weren't there. The bed we slept on would shake either as we were falling asleep or just sitting, or laying on it, I would hear, huh? In my ear constantly as if someone did a short breath in my ear. I would hear voices I couldn't explain. Stuff like that. At one point, my ex was playing around with a security camera he hooked up to the TV somehow, and there was a shit ton of orbs everywhere. Literally over a hundred orbs darting or walking past or following someone around the room, either in front of or behind them, or both. But this one occurrence has haunted me ever since it happened. It was in the middle of the night, after yet another horrible fight between him and I. So horrible, I stormed out of the building and went to go sleep in the van. I'd gotten settled, and after about ten minutes, I looked over across the yard and saw this humanoid figure. It didn't glow, but it was so white and bright against the night I thought it did. It stood with its legs parted and its arms slightly out as if it was about to start running towards me, and it looked like it had a skirt or something at knee length, though it didn't wear clothes or have anything but its body on it. It was just part of its body. I think it didn't have a face or hair or any other feature. It was horrifying. It filled me with such an immobilizing, white-knuckled fear. I was quite literally frozen in fear. It didn't look scary, but it quite literally made me the most scared I'd ever been in my entire life up until this point. I somehow knew it could read my thoughts, and that made it even more horrifying. I knew if I could just get into the house I'd be safe, but I knew the second I tried to move, it would do. Something. It never moved, and I was still literally frozen in fear. If I had to estimate, I'd say I went out to the car around 12.30 or 1 in the morning. I was out there looking at this thing, terrified the entire night, all the way until the sun broke and it was gone. And as soon as it was gone, my body unclenched itself and I was immediately hit with this wave of exhaustion. And I was out like a light. This is where shit gets even more weird. I should start this out my saying, my ex was slash is a drug addict, specifically of meth at this point. He is a liar and a keen manipulator. I'm not sure why he would lie about this, but then again, he could do something right in front of you and lie to your face, so I don't know. I told him what happened, and he got this weird-ass expression on his face. And he told me that at some point or another, he made his way back into the house to use the bathroom, and him tweaking out, he stuck his head out the bathroom window in paranoia and saw a woman looking down where I was through the window of the car. He said he thought it was me and called out to who he thought was me to get back to the house. He said she looked up, he realized it wasn't me, and that she darted off across the front of the car where I was literally looking through the entire night and ran off through the neighbor's yard. I can say with 100% certainty that I was not asleep and that I wasn't dreaming. I was awake the entire night and... I had the bags under my eyes and the fatigue of both lack of sleep and the adrenaline crash to prove it. 
I'm making this post to try and see if anyone knows anything about what the actual that that was or what it could be. It wasn't Nightcrawler. It had arms and it was much more humanoid, and I don't live in the areas in which it's known to manifest in. This experience has been on my mind a lot more than usual lately, and I'm just struggling to come to terms or to rationalize that experience. I am thankfully out of that God's awful house and that even worse relationship two years as of this early January, so no need to worry for my safety or sanity now. I've always been a skeptic when it came to the paranormal. Ghosts, ghouls, and unexplained phenomena were never my cup of tea, so when I joined the police force, I never thought I'd have to face them head on. My name is Jenny Martinez, and this is my story. I was a rookie police officer fresh out of the academy and eager to prove myself. My first assignment was in a small, sleepy town called Oak Hollow. It was the kind of place where everyone knew each other and nothing much ever happened. I was excited to start patrolling the streets, and I couldn't wait to make a difference in the community. One night, while on my usual patrol, I noticed something strange. The air felt heavier, and there was an eerie silence that seemed to cloak the town. I brushed it off as my imagination running wild and continued my patrol. As I turned down an old cobblestone street, I saw it, a ghostly figure of a woman dressed in white standing by the road. My heart pounded in my chest but I convinced myself it was just a trick of the light. I blinked and she was gone. Little did I know this was just the beginning. Over the next few weeks I encountered more inexplicable events. Objects would move on their own. Strange noises echoed through the night, and I would see apparitions of people long dead. I couldn't deny it any longer. Okala was haunted. Desperate for answers, I reached out to a local paranormal investigator named Thomas. He had been researching the town's history for years and agreed to help me get to the bottom of these strange occurrences. Together we discovered that Ocala was built on the site of a tragedy that happened over a century ago. The town's founders had made a pact with a malevolent spirit, and in exchange for power and wealth, they offered the souls of their descendants. The spirits were trapped in limbo, unable to move on until the pact was broken. As a police officer, it was my duty to protect the people of Ocala, even if it meant confronting my own fears and skepticism. Thomas and I had devised a plan to break the pact and set the spirits free. With the help of ancient rituals and Thomas's knowledge of the paranormal, we confronted the malevolent spirit. It was a battle of wills as we struggled to release the trapped souls and, and banish the evil entity from Ocala once and for all. As the night wore on, I could feel the energy shift. The air became lighter, and the oppressive atmosphere that had haunted the town lifted. We had succeeded in breaking the pact and setting the spirits free. My time in Oak Hollow changed me. I went from a skeptic to a believer, and I learned that sometimes the most important battles are fought against forces we cannot see. The spirits of Oak Hollow may have been put to rest, but the memories of that time will stay with me forever. I've never believed in God. It was all too convenient for my liking. The songs and the stories were all wrapped up in putrid desperation that made it hard to believe a word of it. Who would ever come up with such an idea as a divine being that cared equally for seven billion? not excluding those long dead and waiting to be born, of his children was doing nothing more than shouting to the void or begging for therapy. At least it sounded that way to me. What other explanation was there when children were starving or being locked in cages for daring to cross a man-made line of no crossies? How was I supposed to believe that famine and diseases were trials brought to pass by a benevolent being, while people bombed and gassed and starved and enslaved? In the past, when children woke up not knowing if they'd be shot dead for pursuing an education, in the now the pain and suffering that came with simply being alive, it did not seem like the work of a benevolent leader of any sort. 
Honestly, it appeared like tyranny, a child abuse even, and I personally never subscribed to it because of that. While not believing in that, also came the belief of not believing in ghosts, not believing in an afterlife of any sort, and being absolutely tickled pink by the idea of inherently nasty, chronically evil beings, demon. If I could not believe in the absolute good that old women ensured me existed in a god nobody had ever seen, I wasn't sure why they thought they could convince me of the absolute evil that was supposedly too heinous to comprehend but also no match for the goodness that was comprehensible. It did not make a lick of sense. And so, as a result, I left the church before my voice finished deepening and invested my time and effort into something that could, I feel, make a difference. I donated my time and my money in an attempt to help the helpless instead of waiting for some fabled generous deity to help them in my stead. And when I was old enough, I joined the police. Academy in an attempt to actually make a difference. Sure, I smoked, I drank, I indulged in women and men, but when bad things came, I was the first guy people called out to for help. I like to think that if a god does exist, he's simply been playing hooky these past few hundred thousand million years. Anyway, me being too nice is pretty much how I got myself into this mess. I was working the night shift on Saturday. Randy's Saturday night shift, and just so we're clear, I was never meant to suffer this way. Because of my worsening eyesight, I was pretty much removed from the nighttime rotation in an effort to avoid having a half-blind cop having to chase some speeding dipwit down a half-lit Kentucky highway. If not for the fact that Randy's wife had suddenly gone into labor, I never had my faith shaken. You see, it was halfway through my shift, my eyes felt like they were full of sand at this point. My partner, who I'll call Vanessa, suggested we stop for a coffee, calling me a hundred variations of old all the while. But before we had the chance to pull into the only open establishment within a six-mile radius, McDonald's of course, the radio began kicking up status in a report of domestic abuse. Apparently neighbors were having a barbecue and they had heard the woman that lived in the house to the left screaming bloody murder. When they'd gone over to check on the woman that lived there at the house, things had gone silent, and they'd been left standing at the door talking to nobody at all. We pulled into the neighborhood in record time, leaving the car with our hands already hovering at our belts, the door easily gave beneath our combined force. When the sound ceased its echoing, I led the way into the house, a darn ear holding my breath as I tried not to make a sound of anything. I'd been to graveyards with more life and stillness, and it also made me nervous. Civilians had not reported gunshots or slamming unless he strangled her, and there was no sign he'd killed her at all. What Wayne meant most nervous, though, was the dust that coated the counters and furniture. It was so thick I could draw it in. There was no evidence that anybody at all had been there in months, which meant that we'd either been set up or the neighbors who were delusional. Vanessa and I combed the house from top to bottom, searching very carefully for signs of struggle, and when we found nothing, we headed back to the front. Our shift was nearly over at this point, and we did not have the energy to press for details. A door swinging open to my left gave me a moment's pause. We'd been so sure to close each door behind ourselves, as it was the first thing we learned in police academy. You always be hyper aware of your surroundings and alert. You never know when things may turn awry. I was quick to chalk it up to something loose in the hinges. Vanessa shuddered and went for the rosary she kept in her front breast pocket. She held it so tightly it was nearly convincing. Almost. Maybe the snorting was unnecessary. Maybe, perhaps, if I hadn't chosen to be such a pig about being an atheist, that thing wouldn't have wasted its time. But I was, so it did. A whisper that ran cold on my back seemed to lock up my ear with four words that made my entire body run cold. You're going to hell. I don't know who was faster on the way down the stairs at me or Vanessa, but at some point I was dragging her after me and into the open air. We turned to search for the neighbors we left outside, only to find the entire street was now dark. There was no sign that anybody had ever been there at all. 
Vanessa took that information in, heading for the car, telling me to come up with an explanation for that. And honestly, to this day, I don't have one. I feel a little more open-minded after this event, and maybe as time goes on, I'll come to know the real truth. Perhaps my judgment of things in life is not all that accurate, given this new experience. I had always loved camping. There was something about being out in the wilderness, away from the noise and distractions of the city that brought me a sense of peace. So when my friends suggested we take a camping trip to a remote national park, I was all in. We arrived at the park in the late afternoon and set up camp in a clearing deep in the woods. The sun was setting and we huddled around the campfire roasting marshmallows and telling ghost stories. It was the perfect start to our trip. But as the night wore on, things started to get strange. It started with a rustling in the bushes, which we dismissed as a deer or some other animal. But then we heard footsteps and whispers and the sound of twigs snapping underfoot. At first, we thought it was just our imaginations playing tricks on us. But then we saw something moving in the shadows, watching us from the edge of the clearing. It was too dark to make out any details, but we could tell it was something big, and it was getting bolder by the hour. We tried to ignore it, telling ourselves that it was just a bear or a wolf, but deep down we knew something was wrong. The air was thick with an oppressive feeling of unease, and we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. As the night wore on, the sounds grew louder and more frequent. We heard growling and snarling and the sound of claws scraping against tree bark. We tried to stay calm, but our nerves were frayed and we were on edge. It was then that we realized we were not alone in the woods. There was something out there, something watching us, and it was getting closer. We huddled together, our hearts pounding in our chests, as a creature emerged from the shadows. It was like nothing we had ever seen before. A hulking mass of fur and muscle, with gleaming eyes and razor-sharp teeth. We ran, our screams echoing through the forest as we fled into the night. We didn't stop until we were miles away from the campsite. And even then, we could still feel its eyes on us. In the days that followed, we tried to make sense of what had happened. We reported the incident to the park rangers, but they dismissed it as a bear sighting. But we knew what we had seen, and we knew it was something far more terrifying than any ordinary animal. From that day on, I could never go camping again without the nagging feeling that something was watching me from the woods. And even now, years later, I can still hear the sound of twigs snapping underfoot and the growl of the creature that haunted our dream. I always thought I had seen it all. As a ranger at the National Park, I had patrolled some of the most remote and secluded areas of the wilderness. But nothing could have prepared me for what I stumbled upon one evening. It was just another routine patrol, or so I thought. The sun had already set, and the thick trees surrounding me cast long shadows on the ground. I was making my way through a dense section of the park when I noticed something strange. There, in the middle of the woods, was a staircase. It wasn't like any staircase I'd ever seen before. It was old, made of stone, and looked like it had been there for centuries. But what was even stranger was that it seemed to lead nowhere. It just went up and ended abruptly in mid-air. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to climb the stairs. As I reached the top, I felt a strange sensation, like the ground beneath me was shifting. When I looked around, I realized I was no longer in the same place. The woods looked different, and I couldn't recognize any of the trees or landmarks around me. It was then that I saw an abandoned cabin in the distance. It looked like it had been left untouched for years, and there was an eerie silence that surrounded it. I approached the cabin slowly, trying to be as quiet as possible. As I peered through the window, I saw something that made my blood run cold. Inside the cabin, there were various scientific instruments and research papers scattered around. But what caught my eye was a cage in the corner of the room. It was empty, but it looked like it had been used to contain something large and dangerous. As I continued to explore the cabin, I found more evidence of some kind of cryptid. 
There were photographs of strange creatures that could shape, shift, and blend in with their surroundings. It was unlike anything I had ever seen or heard of before. Suddenly I heard a sound coming from outside. It was a low growl, and it sounded like it was getting closer. I quickly realized that I had to get out of there, but as I turned to leave, I found that the cabin had disappeared and I was lost in the woods. I tried to retrace my steps, but everything looked different, and I couldn't find my way back. As the hours turned into days and the days turned into weeks, I began to lose hope. I was alone, lost, and afraid. The cryptid that had been studied in the cabin was nowhere to be seen, but I knew that it was out there somewhere. As the weeks turned into months, I began to lose my mind. I could hear strange noises and see things that I couldn't explain. I knew that the cryptid was toying with me and that it was only a matter of time before it made its move. I've always had a deep connection to nature that only grew through the years. During my last two years of high school, most of my friends moved out of state, so I started spending more and more time with the trees and less time with other people, even to the point that after spending a semester in a hot, crowded dorm, I decided college wasn't for me and dropped out. My parents were happy enough to see me, but I could still feel their discomfort with my educational decisions. I don't blame them. It just felt wrong is hardly the most well thought out or valid of arguments, but it was all I had to offer them at the time. I knew it wasn't enough, so I left. I quickly packed my bags, threw them in my car, and headed north with no particular destination in mind. After several hours on the road, the highway I was on narrowed and turned to dirt while the trees standing silent sentinel along its meandering path got taller and darker. I drove slowly with the windows down, both to take in the incredible sights and to avoid careening off this dirt track clinging so desperately to the mountain. Once I rolled down my windows, I turned off my music. It felt out of place in the peaceful environment. My eyelids were getting heavier, the sun having long disappeared beneath the horizon, so I pulled off onto a little patch of dirt on the side of the road. I started getting ready to sleep, but when I looked out into the trees, I once again felt their call, so I left. Walking from the car, the silence was so potent it sucked the air from my lungs. This silence was ancient and sacred. I felt breaking it with any significant noise would be a great sin against the forces of nature. A gust of wind noiselessly made its way through the trees, stirring the lowest branches and tossing my hair in my face. On the wings of the silent wind, I heard a sound so soft and natural it could perhaps only be heard because of the unnatural absence of background noise. It drew my attention to one particular tree a couple hundred feet from the road. All the trees were dancing to the silent rhythm of the wind, all except one. This one danced off beat and irregularly to no particular rhythm. It seemed as if each branch had a mind of its own. Every bough twisted and writhed like an unfortunate worm on a fisherman's hook, the wood bending impossibly. The noise then seemed to form words in a language so old it had not been uttered for centuries at least. Yet I understood. They told me they lived in the silent spaces of the world, where their words could be heard. Once the world was full of silent spaces, spaces where animals and man alike instinctively knew no noise above a whisper was permitted, but humans had lost touch with their instincts, only some being able to feel the unspoken rules that govern all. I fell to my knees in silent reverence for the gods that once were and will be again. They have a plan, they said. We will return the world to how it once was when the gods reigned and silence owned large swaths of land. The hum of a motor accompanied by the sound of tires tearing up moist dirt ripped me from my state of pleasant reverence. I inhaled sharply and looked up to notice the first faint glow that changes the sky from black to dark blue before dawn warms the air and brings the sun. I returned to the road to get a glimpse of our invader, but when he saw me he quickly pulled over and got out of his car. Hey man, are you all right? He called while approaching. 
His voice cut through the air, shocking me into stunned silence for a second. Yeah, I'm fine, I whispered, my voice seeming no less strange in the environment. My car is over there, just keep driving. Dude, you're covered in dirt. Your knees are clearly bleeding and you're shivering violently. I can't just leave you here. I'll call for help. I knew I couldn't let him call for help, lest more people invade our sanctuary, our church. All right, I'll go with you, but can I please show you something first? He was clearly skeptical, but given that he seemed to have a good 100 pounds on me, he probably thought I wasn't much of a threat, and so he nodded his head and followed where I beckoned. He so clearly wanted to help and seemed like a good guy, so I thought I would induct him into my newfound religion and have him help with the mission assigned by them. When we finally reached the tree, I grabbed him by the shoulder and pointed, hoping he would grasp all that I did. He shot me a puzzled look, so in a whisper as quiet as I could manage, I said, this is our connection to the gods. All right, I'm getting you help, he cried in a voice far too loud to be tolerated. I knew immediately that this transgression would need to be punished. He quickly turned towards the road and made to return, in his haste stepping on leaves and branches, increasing his sins and sealing his fate. Given his determination to get back, he didn't hear me pick up the branch or close the gap between us. He gave a soft grunt when the wood connected with the base of his skull and fell silent at last, ceasing his transgressions. I dragged the body of the offender back to the base to the base of the tree. It just felt right, and once his skin touched the bark, the tree reacted. Almost instantly, roots broke the damp soil and coiled around what was once a human being. Pencil. Thin roots carved into his body by the hundreds, tunneling in and out and back in again, giving his flesh the appearance of a very wormy apple or wood afflicted by termites. Within minutes, the fresh corpse was desecrated and nearly mummified, bringing a smile to my lips as I felt my connection to the gods increase. The voices started back up with renewed vigor, and my mission was made clear to me. The next one needs to be alive. I live in Evanston, Illinois, just north of Chicago. I was asked by my mother's friend to move some stuff to a storage unit nearby. I had not been working because of pandemic, and the pay was decent, so I went ahead and agreed. It was raining all day off and on, but at times it got so heavy that I couldn't transfer boxes from my car to the unit. So I just get comfortable inside the unit and listen to some music while I wait for the rain to clear up. It's cozy in there, to be honest, and the rain just keeps getting worse. It's not very cold out, though. I'm just chilling when I start hearing this banging noise from nearby. It sounds like something hitting metal at first. I think that maybe there was a car accident on the nearby highway, North Lincoln Ave Highway 41, but then I realized it was coming from the other direction, and I really don't want to go outside and get wet. I tell myself that someone probably dropped something, like nothing serious, but I continue hearing various banging noises. I still didn't bother checking, but as it continues, I decide to check it out since the rain had let up a bit. I walk outside and turn the corner and see this massive hole in the fence, leading to a little wooded area at the North Shore Channel Trail. I see this white thing moving near and under the dumpster by the fence. I'm thinking that it was a large white garbage trash bag, but it just doesn't look right. I'm confused, and I'm trying to get like a closer look at the thing. I, uh, I may be about 100 feet or so away from it, and I see something sticking out of it, and it's making a clicking sound. I say, hello, who's that? I immediately regret yelling this out. Something big squeezes out from underneath the dumpster. It looks like a pile of fleshy tissue with spike-like protrusions. It stands four feet tall, but then it extends up to over six feet. It looks like a humanoid spider or other insect, but with white flesh. It doesn't have an exoskeleton, just smooth white flesh. The head is weird, kind of insect, like with no mouth that I could see. The eyes were human, like and had a reddish glow. It had long slits along the side of its head. It stood there, clicking and watching me. I could sense that it didn't want me there. I was wondering why I was still there and hadn't run off. 
but I was frozen in place and terrified. I had heard about the Chicago Mothman and was wondering if this may have been it, but it didn't resemble anything that I'd ever heard about. Then I felt a sudden rush of calm come over me, and I was able to break the trance I was in. I hauled ass back to the storage unit, locked it up, got into my car, and quickly left. When I looked back in the direction of the creature, it was gone. I returned the next day and finished unloading the boxes from the car as fast as I could. This happened in the spring of 2020. I haven't told anyone about this. Grew up in Detroit, Michigan. At an early age, both me and my brother started seeing ghosts or things we couldn't explain. But when I was in middle school, things started to get a little weirder. One night I woke up and couldn't fall back to sleep, so as I laid on my back, staring at the dimly lit ceiling from my nightlight, I felt my stomach turn. I looked out my bedroom door. My door was always open, and I could see partially into my parents' bedroom, and I thought one of my parents were coming out of the room, but it was a tall, six, seven-foot man with a brown jacket and brimmed hat. He walked straight towards me. Well, it was more like gliding, but I put my head under my covers and screamed for my parents. The light came on, and they asked me what happened. But when I told them, they chalked it up to being a nightmare. Well, this happened about four or five more times, and my mom started to believe me, but my dad wasn't really convinced that the brown jacket man was real. When I started high school, my dad had put two additions on our house, a huge back room and an entire second floor. Me and my brother shared the second floor during high school. The main big room was our bedroom, and we had a walk and closet bathroom. It was here where we had the scariest encounter of our lives. Our bed sat about four or five feet off the floor, and our room at night glowed a dark blue from our ceiling fan's blue light. And one night I was lying there trying to sleep when I heard the voice of a man, but it sounded sped up and playing backwards. I had heard this before with other encounters in our home, but it was coming from our closet bathroom. And that's when I heard my brother say, Dude, do you hear that? I was so relived that he was awake, but I couldn't believe he heard it too. So I replied the voice that sounds like it's talking backwards. Yeah, I, I hear it. We both sat up in our beds, and the voice kept talking. We started to hear footsteps with the voice, which was now pacing back and forth. Then the door handle started freaking out. I am getting chills just typing and rethinking about this. So I leaned over my bed rail so I could see the door handle shaking. My brother looked as if he was gonna jump out of his bed and run down the damn stairs. But then the door opened, and I instantly said, What do you see? because the way my brother's bed was positioned, he could see right into the closet. But he said he saw nothing in the doorway, and then slam! Now the door whipped shut, and he jumped out of bed and turned on the lights. We finally got our courage up and opened the door and checked both the closet and bathroom, but nothing was in there and the voice had ceased. We thought maybe it was one of our cats, but nothing was in there and the windows were shut too. I got back in my bed, and my brother stood next to me, and we talked about what the hell just happened, when suddenly I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. I was looking at my brother, but he noticed it too, because we both turned to look at the same time, and this white cloud-looking thing shot under our futon, and we both froze. We looked under the futon, but once again, nothing. We stayed up for a couple hours that night discussing what happened, and we still discuss it to this day. As time went on, the door handle would occasionally flip out again, and the door would open and slam. Some of my friends witnessed this as well. And me and my brother saw the hat man a couple of times in the early morning standing in the middle of our room. My dad would tell us, why would there be ghosts upstairs? I just built it. Why would it be haunted? My mom, however, finally believed us one day as I stayed home sick from school. We were watching a movie in the family room, which was right under me in my brother's bedroom. And we heard the closet door fly open upstairs, and something ran across the room and then ran back to the closet, and it slammed closed. My mom turned her head to me, and she freaked out. What EFF was, that she said, and I just replied with C. I told you. Other things were often heard, too. 
I would often hear a little girl laughing or talking. She would even say my name from time to time. One time she whispered hi into my ear as I was laying in my bed one morning. My brother and I had a theory that ghosts were connected to this old baseball bat that was found in my parents' closet when they first moved in the house. It was a dark red wooden bat that had the year 1901 on it. We still have the bat, but my brother has since sanded it down and made it smooth, which I did not agree with, but he did it anyway. We moved out of the house in the late 2000s, but the hat man followed, and so did some activity. No reverse-talking ghosts, though. Sometimes I thought of ringing the doorbell and asking the new family that lives there if they have experienced anything. The last time I saw the hat man was a few years ago, maybe 2012 or 2013. I was experimenting with lucid dreaming, astral travel, and one night I awoke with sleep paralysis, and sometimes I wouldn't see anything during sleep paralysis, and other times I would see shadow people or a black thing sitting on my chest. But this time the hat man was at the foot of my bed, and he had two children with him, one at each side. Both of these kids looked old-timey. They were dressed as if they wee, from the early 1900s. One was a boy maybe around the age of 10, 12, and he had an old-looking suit on, and the other was a little girl in a white dress. She was probably six, seven years old, and I instantly thought that's the girl that said hi. And then they vanished. I had been working as a park ranger for many years and had always heard rumors about the mysterious creature known as Bigfoot. Most dismissed it as a myth, but there were enough sightings over the years to make me curious. One night, while on patrol, I saw something moving in the distance. I approached cautiously, my flashlight shining on a huge, hairy creature standing over eight feet tall. It was Bigfoot. I couldn't believe it. The creature that had been the subject of countless legends was standing right in front of me, and it was angry. It charged at me, and I instinctively pulled out my knife, ready to defend myself. The creature was strong, but I was fast and managed to dodge its attacks. I swung my knife with all my strength and landed a hit on its chest. It roared in pain, but didn't back down. We battled for what seemed like an eternity, until finally... I landed a fatal blow. Bigfoot stumbled back, and I watched as it collapsed onto the ground motionless. I was both scared and amazed at what I had accomplished, but my victory was short-lived. As I made my way back to the station, I noticed that something wasn't right. I was injured, and the wounds were getting worse by the minute. I knew that Bigfoot had hurt me more than I realized. I stumbled through the woods trying to make it back to the station, but it was too late. I collapsed on the ground, my strength fading away. I could hear the sound of my colleagues' voices in the distance, but it was too late. The injuries were too severe, and I knew that I was going to die. As I lay there, I thought about my life and all the things I had accomplished. I had always loved my job and felt honored to protect the park and all its inhabitants, but I never imagined that my encounter with Bigfoot would be my downfall. In the end, I died alone in the woods, a victim of a creature that most people didn't even believe existed. But I knew the truth, and I hoped that my story would serve as a warning to others who dared to venture into the unknown. The park could be a beautiful and peaceful place, but it was also full of danger, and sometimes the danger could be too much to handle. I always wanted to explore the Native American culture and traditions. That's why I booked a tour to visit a reservation. Little did I know that it would turn out to be the scariest experience of my life. It was a sunny day when we arrived at the reservation. Our tour guide, a friendly Native American man, took us on a tour around the place. He told us about their traditions and showed us some of the ancient artifacts and burial sites. As we were walking around, one of the tourists accidentally kicked a small rock near one of the burial sites. Suddenly, we heard a loud growl coming from the site. The guide's expression changed, and he told us to quickly leave the area. We were all confused and scared, but we followed his orders. 
As we were walking back, I could hear something following us, something that sounded like it was growling and snarling. We finally reached our campsite, and the guide told us to stay in our tents and not to leave until morning. He said that we had disturbed an ancient burial site and awakened a vengeful spirit known as the Wendigo. I could feel a fear slowly creeping up my spine. That night, we could hear strange noises coming from outside our tents. The growling sound was getting louder, and we could hear branches snapping and leaves rustling. Suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream. I could feel my heart racing, and I knew that something was very wrong. I peeked out of my tent and saw a huge figure standing near the entrance. It was a creature that looked like a human, but with long arms and legs, and its eyes were glowing red. I knew then that it was the Wendigo, and it was coming for us. We tried to call for help, but there was no signal on our phones. We were trapped with no way out. The Wendigo started to attack our tents, ripping them apart with its long arms. I could hear my fellow tourists screaming in terror. Suddenly, a Native American man appeared, carrying a burning torch. He shouted something in his language, and the Wendigo turned to face him. The man walked towards the creature, holding the torch high. The creature backed away, growling and snarling. The man kept walking, and the creature finally vanished into the darkness. The man told us that he was a shaman, and that he had been summoned to help us. He said that the Wendigo was a vengeful spirit, and that we had disturbed its resting place. He performed a ritual to calm the spirit down and send it back to where it came from. The next morning, the guide told us that we were lucky to have survived the attack of the Wendigo. He said that we had to be careful when visiting ancient burial sites, as they were sacred places that should not be disturbed. I knew then that I would never forget this experience, that I had witnessed something that few people ever get to see. It was back sometime in 2019, late in the year. One of my friends, whose name is Ted, saw something in the middle of the night. Tired and feeling fatigued, he woke up, rolling out of his bed to head to the bathroom and then the kitchen for a late night snack. Whilst indulging in his snack, he began walking around his living room until he made his way to the back of the house window. It was on the second floor by the kitchen, to which, while staring outside at whatever, a sudden figure in his backyard caught his attention. The yard is huge and nothing really in it aside from two trees, one of which has since rotted and fallen down. He noticed a bit past the since-rotted tree was a figure with glowing reds, large snout, and standing at an approximate seven to eight feet tall from seeing the creature reared up on its legs and judging its size by how tall it appeared to be next to the tree. It also had jet black fur as well as a muscular physique similar to Arnold back in the 80s, a long snout with very large perked ears similar to a German shepherd or wolf in what looked to be antlers, or maybe that was just part of its long ears. He doesn't really know, because it was very dark. The creature took a sniff and looked directly at him. As his eyes met the gaze of the creature's eyes, he noticed that the eyes were a shade of blood red, the same color mentioned before. He couldn't believe what he was seeing, but also mentioned he'd seen so many weird things and such that he wasn't really fazed by it in the slightest. He knew what he was looking at was the real deal, and saw its breath in the cold night air. As the creature grunted and bared its teeth, it also started growling at him. The growl wasn't that of any normal animal, but a deep primal guttural growl, nothing like he's ever heard before. The creature then took one last gaze at him and ran off, jumping the fence. He shortly afterwards returned to his room, laying in his bed, wondering what did he really see. He found it hard to fall back to sleep, but late on, luckily did. He still wonders to this day if the creature will ever return, or if he will ever see it again. This encounter was not far away from where I live, but is absolutely horrifying to think about, because we live in the suburbs. To this day, he still does not know what he really saw, and it can only be left up to whomever's imagination. My father worked at NASA's Johnson Space Flight Center, 
as a teenager growing up in the suburbs of Houston, Texas, I was also able to make my way into the great outdoors. I was a Boy Scout, and we would take numerous camping trips throughout Texas, the hill country, and the piney woods. My mother's parents owned a ranch in northeast Texas, and it was a frequent family destination for holidays and sometimes just for a family vacation. I learned how to fish, hunt, and pitch a tent, basic survival skills at an early age. I would often take treks into the woods by myself without a care in the world. Thinking back on certain events that happened back then, I now look back on it with a different viewpoint, mostly because what I'm about to tell you is my later experience in the Ozark National Forest at night, and it has profoundly changed the way I look at my life. I moved to northwest Arkansas in 2005. My brother and mother had earlier moved to Rees Mill, Arkansas. I would frequently fish at Lake Lincoln. I would often park my truck a short walking distance from the dam and then walk up and fish from the dam bank. During one visit I began to work my way off the dam and into some thick brush and trees to get to the larger boulder protruding over the lake's bank. As I approached the tree line I began to have an eerie feeling. It came over me out of nowhere. Now I have been in the woods alone many times before and have never felt this sensation. I quickly grabbed my rod and reeled along with my tackle box and I made it back to my truck. I've not been back to Lake Lincoln since a year later around 2007. I had moved 40 minutes from my mother's place. I had just gone into business for myself. I was single and lived alone. I would often get bored and would take drives throughout the mountains and sometimes even at night. One late night I decided I need to get out for a long ride. I was going to head to my mother's place. I started down the freeway and then exited off onto Highway 16. I continued down Highway 16 for about 20 miles, and then I turned left onto County Road 33, and then it would just be another 10 miles or so before turning off to get to my mother's home. I went across the Illinois River Bridge and made a sharp curve to the left. It went up a steep hill and then entered the Ozark National Forest. It was dark, only my headlights lighting up my way. At the time, there was no cell service. I was smack dab in the middle of nowhere. I reached Weddington Lake. As I began to climb up the next hill, I remembered there was a small pull-off lookout to my left, and I needed to relieve myself. I pulled my truck over across the oncoming lane and onto the lookout shoulder. I left my motor running along with my headlights. I stepped out, leaving my truck door open, and... I began to relieve myself. To the right of me, there was somewhat of a cliff overseeing a small pond on the opposite side of the lake, which was to my left. I found myself fixated on that ridge top. I then had this overwhelming feeling come over me. The hairs on the back of my neck began to stand up, and goosebumps were running down my arms. There was a strong feeling that someone or something was watching me. I was standing outside of a lit-up truck in the middle of nowhere, and I was a sitting duck. I quickly finished, jumped into my truck, threw it into drive, and I squealed my wheels up the hill. Some years later, I married and had become a father. My family and I went hiking through the same lake, but on the other side. There was a rock-covered enclosure that the Parks and Recreation had built some years back. While there, those same eerie feelings came back. Something wasn't right. I kept it to myself, and we finished our day of fun. A short time later, I found myself researching Bigfoot sightings in Arkansas. A significant sighting had been documented in that same area just prior to my roadside event. I also read of a sighting of a red-headed Bigfoot digging in the sand, underneath a bridge along the Illinois River. I come to find out that sightings had been documented all over this area, dating back many years. I then began to think of my childhood, and the things began to add up like the time my grandmother would tell my brother and me as kids not to venture back into certain parts of the wooded areas. Also, the times Grandpa's bird dogs would go into a barking frenzy in the middle of the night and he would step outside shooting a shotgun into the air. I can't adventure into the woods much anymore, certainly not alone, and certainly not at night. I'm a Bigfoot believer. I truly feel that my overwhelming strange feelings were the result of a Bigfoot either watching me or being in the area.
Good afternoon. I'm an Orthodox priest from Russia. In 2020, one in the Crimea in the mountains above Yalta, I personally saw Bigfoot. It was attracted by the sound of the whistle on which I played in the Yukosh track. Bigfoot went out to a rock located opposite the west of me. I was on the east side of the gorge. They were about 300 meters between us. It looked tall, strikingly taller than a man, massive body and shoulders, long arms and long legs. While I took out the camera to photograph him, he went up the slope with huge steps of about two meters approximately. When I photographed the place where he was, all the pictures were overexposed, and my Canon EOS 5D Mark II let me down for the first time, such as the short story of my second and such a bright meeting with Bigfoot. I grew up around Point Pleasant. As a kid, the Mothman was ubiquitous. Everyone had a story. Relatives, neighbors, friends, brothers, roommates, you get the idea. Just hearing about it always gave me the chills. My parents divorced when I was young, and me and my mom eventually moved out of Point Pleasant. I was an only child, and I'd spent summers with my dad. I loved them, but I didn't feel like I was that connected with them back then. He used to take me camping a lot. He was an outdoorsman, and he loved introducing me to the beauty of nature. It was okay, but honestly, I would have rather watched movies or played video games. During one of our trips, I wandered from our site to gather wood for a fire. The sun had already gone down, and it was getting pretty dark. I wandered a bit too far. And as I looked around, I didn't see my dad or our tit. That's when I heard this strange clicking sound coming from up in the trees. I looked up and froze, dropping the sticks in my hands. The shadowy figure was perched high in the branches, maybe about twenty feet up. Two glowing red eyes pierced the darkness, staring right at me. They were big and round, and I remember being held under their spell, like I was hypnotized or something. I was convinced it was the Mothman. The branches creaked as the creature stood up and spread its massive wings. It swooped down from the tree, shrieking. I docked and covered my eyes and felt this gust of wind as it skimmed over me. I stayed curled up in a ball, screaming, until I felt my dad pick me up and hug me, said it was the Mothman as I sobbed uncontrollably. He calmed me down, and we walked back to our tent where he cooked us dinner of hot dogs and canned beans. We ate in silence, and he could tell that I was still bothered by the experience. We heard an owl in the trees, and he said a lot of times, owls are mistaken for the Mothman. He took out a flashlight and shined it around the trees, trying to find the owl. Sure enough, he caught it, and its eyes reflected this orange-red glow. The owl flew off after being identified, but I was sure the creature I saw was much bigger. I asked him what the Mothman was. He thought for a moment, then he said it was a force of nature that we just don't understand. But it shouldn't be feared. Instead, it should be revered and respected. I never heard of the Mothman described that way, and I asked him if he ever saw it himself. He paused thoughtfully, smiled, and shook his head no. Normally, after dinner, we'd stargaze, and my dad would point out the constellations. But I just went into the tent and tried to go to sleep. That night, I had a horrible dream with a vivid imagery of fire, broken glass, and twisted metal. At the time, I had no idea what it meant, but it was so real. I woke up screaming. Once again, my dad had to calm me down when I told him about my dream. He gave me a strange look. We weren't scheduled to leave until the following afternoon. But I was so unnerved, I begged him to go home early. My dad was a good sport and didn't complain. As we packed up our stuff, I felt guilty and apologized for ruining the trip. He reassured me that everything would be okay, and that we'd make up for it with a movie night. As soon as we got on to Route 62, I felt much better. The next day, we were watching TV in the afternoon, and a breaking news story interrupted the program. Apparently, there was a major pileup on Route 62. After a big rig overturned, several cars were involved and there were fatalities. It stopped traffic in both directions for hours. My dad commented that it happened on the same route that we took home. 
If we stuck to our schedule and left the campground when we were originally supposed to, we very well could have been involved in that accident. They continued watching the news in silence before finally turning to me and admitting that he did see the Mothman once when he was in high school. At least he thought he did. He and some friends were driving along Route 62 one night. They were drag racing. He knew it was a stupid thing to do, but they were just teenagers. Suddenly, a winged creature started following them. No matter how fast they drove it easily, kept up he said it was dark and that he couldn't make out its features. But he never forgot its large glowing eyes. He and his friends slowed down and the creature disappeared. That night, he had a dream exactly like the one I had. He thought it was a warning and vowed never to race again. Unfortunately, his friend died in a car wreck a few weeks later while drag racing. One of the things that you hear about the Mothman is that he brings doom. Like the infamous Silver Bridge collapse in 1967 that more or less introduced him. While some blamed him for that event and other tragedies over the years, my dad believed that the Mothman was just an omen. How you interpret it is entirely up to you. I know some would say he's evil personify. A servant of the devil or something like that. I don't think he's good or evil. He just is. He doesn't pick sides. But if you see him set aside your fear and pay attention to what he's trying to tell you, I don't know what I actually saw that night in the forest. It was dark and my overactive kid imagination immediately saw a monster. But like my dad said, and even proved, it could have been an owl. I can't help but think that the signing in my dreams were the Mothman trying to warn me. Just like he warned my dad, I wondered how many other people he appeared to. And how many of them listened. The relationship between me and my dad changed that summer. We became closer. I guess sharing bizarre experiences will do that. I haven't seen the Mothman since, but I haven't been afraid either. My dad is old now, and we don't go camping like we used to, but I cherish every moment with him. In some way, the Mothman taught me that life is fleeting and never take it for granted. My husband and I frequent a local weekly farmer's market. We generally start up at the top building so he can run to use the bathroom. I stand patiently outside and wait. I am an anxious and empathetic person, so I try to just keep to myself as I wait. So I'm just standing there, probably staring at the floor or something, and this guy comes out of the bathroom and just stands beside me. Oh, whatever. I look up and he looks at me and says, going to be a full moon tonight said something else about luck, and I just kind of stood there looking at him. Husband comes out of the bathroom, and we head off. A short while later, this man and another man walk by. The man who spoke to me earlier looked my way, said something to the other guy I couldn't catch, then said I'd know her anywhere. Okay, next up, I travel a lot, and we like to visit odd places. We stopped at this radio place, an older woman walked people through. Her husband had collected them and had passed away. There was a smaller shed building and then a garage. I had gone in the shed just a moment and left my husband to go back to the truck. After a short while, him and the woman came out of the shed. She walked over to me with hands cupped, kinda shyly, and said she had a gift for me. I said, oh yeah, a gift, and put my hands out in front of her where she placed a beaded Christmas spider. She didn't really say much other than there's info online about them. I got out of the truck to follow them along in the garage. I had the gift in my hand. I swear when I walked through that garage, I felt all these tiny little spiderweb threads tickling my legs and arm. I was brushing at my leg as though to well brush it away. No one else seemed to notice. Even after going back outside, I had mentioned it to my husband. He brushed me off like I did the webs. I went to a friend's house in the Bridgeport area of Harrison County, West Virginia, to sight in my new rifle. He began to tell me a story of a strange animal that was killed on this farm by the man who owned it before his death. The farmer was a coon hunter and went out almost every night. One night, the farmer's dogs got on a scent and took off. They ran for about an hour and stopped at the base of a tree as usual. 
The farmer made his way up the hill to the tree to shoot the coon the dogs had cornered. There was nothing there, though. Thinking this was very strange, he started to look around when he noticed a tree, with its limbs shaking. Something was jumping from tree to tree to keep from being seen. The farmer, finding this very strange, went and told my friend what had happened and dismissed it altogether. About a week later, the supposed creature did the same trick. This made the old man suspicious because his dogs were very well trained and had never let him down before. This happened for about a month when one night the dogs treed an animal and the farmer got there quickly and shot it. To his surprise, it was no coon. It had long grayish-brown hair and was about five feet tall. Its hands were human-like and its feet were more hand-like than anything. I told my friend he was crazy, so he decided to prove it to me. He told me the old man kept the animal but did not have it mounted because he was afraid he had done something wrong. My friend took me to the old barn and there it was. The old man had nailed its carcass to the wall. I was shocked. It was built a lot like a human and had hair six or seven inches long on it. It had very large sharp teeth and resembled some kind of ape looking creature. I told my friend I wouldn't say anything about it, but I feel that it is my duty to report this. If anyone has any idea what the animal could be, please let me know. This happened somewhere between 2007, 2011, summer or fall. Clear sky with a full moon, if I remember right. It wasn't too long after sunset. My friend and I were walking through a cemetery on the edge of town. As we were walking down the main lane through the cemetery, something came running from the gate and passed us on our left. My friend had laughed and asked if I had heard that, and I stopped walking and responded that no, but I had seen it. As the thing had passed between head zones, I caught a look. It looked like a pale, emaciated humanoid that was running on all fours. It had no hair at all that I could see, and I did not get a look at the face. It was moving far faster than any person running on hands' feet should have been able to. My friend and I just stayed frozen there and waited for another friend to come and get us, because we were too scared to move. It continued to circle us as we could hear it moving around. It never seemed threatening. If anything, it seemed curious scared of us, but who knows? I do know that it was not a coyote or a stray dog. I never saw the face, but I did see the head. It did not have a muzzle. There was no tail, either. It definitely didn't have fur. It had pale, almost bluish skin, and I remember I could make out the ribs from where I was standing. Forgive me if this is a hot mess of a post. I was up all night researching this thing, and when I did fall asleep, I didn't sleep well. I was driving down the highway one night around 3 a.m. heading home from work. Usually I would only pass one car every few minutes. Per usual I saw lone headlights coming over the hill towards me on the other side of the highway. As I got within and about 300 yards or so, they abruptly turned almost at a 90 degree angle towards the woods. I was confused at first due to the darkness, thinking it was a wild teenager taking an exit at high speed. The headlights came bulleting out of the woods, straight over the highway and towards me. So I slammed the brakes and the car flipped and spun around upside down and landed against the guardrail on my right. I was stopped at this point and ran out to help. A man bloody crawled out of his upside down car and all he said was don't call the police. He pulled himself over the guardrail and stumbled down towards the wood line and disappeared. So I got in my car and went home. In the early 1990s, Bob drove up the M62 to Manchester, where he was due to perform a comedy routine as part of a cabaret show. As usual, Bob's performance was very warmly received by the audience, and in appreciation decided to go back on stage for a further 20 minutes. While he was performing his additional material, he noticed a beautiful-looking woman of about 25 or 30 years of age sitting at a table. She was smiling at Bob, and she reminded him of the 70s film actress Farrah Fawcett Majors. 
After he had finished his comedy act and had basked in the audience's enthusiastic applause, Bob went backstage and changed. Then the manager of the club escorted him to a specially reserved table for a meal and a drink. Just before the next performer took to the stage, Bob made his way over to the table where the woman was sitting alone and asked her if she would care to join him. The woman smiled and accepted without any hesitation. She was very tall and looked even more attractive at closer quarters. She had sapphire blue eyes and long blonde hair. In a soft voice, she said, my name's Danielle. Her accent was not a local one, but was difficult to place. Bob ordered champagne and was soon flirting with Danielle. The woman, however, refused the champagne and preferred to sip mineral water. There was a stay behind at the club, and it was not long before Bob and Danielle were dancing slowly, tightly embracing each other. He learned that the reason Danielle was on her own was that her boyfriend had arranged to meet her at the club, but had not turned up for some reason. She told him that she lived in St. Helens, and Bob said that, as she had not been drinking, she could drive him home to Merseyside in his car. Danielle was not keen and instead preferred that Bob stay overnight at her home until he was fit enough to drive in the morning. At 3 a.m., Bob and Danielle left the club in Manchester and walked through the chilly night air towards the club car park. Danielle shivered in her sleeveless top, so Bob gave her his leather jacket. Danielle had to strap Bob's seatbelt on for him because he was so intoxicated. Minutes later, the couple embarked on the return journey down the M62. During the journey, Bob fumbled for the controls of the car radio, but Danielle's hand intercepted his, and so the couple sat in silence as the car sped along the motorway. Suddenly stirring from his alcohol-induced doze, Bob turned to look at Danielle and saw something that still gives him nightmares to this day. The girl's beautiful features had contorted into what can only be described as a demonic scowl. Her head swiveled towards him, and her eyes turned blood red, and her mouth opened wide, twice as wide as a normal mouth, to reveal a fearsome array of pointed teeth. The comedian instantly became sober, but felt faint and breathless with the shock. The girl sitting in the driving seat of his car must be some sort of supernatural entity and was driving him goodness knows where. As if it was able to read his mind, the thing in the driving seat screamed with manic laughter in zigzag between the lanes of the motorway. Bob was not a religious man, but he suddenly found himself imploring, Jesus, please save me. The car screeched into a 180-degree turn and slid off the hard shoulder onto a slip road, then veered into a ditch. Bob opened the door and tried to get out, but in his blind panic, he forgot to unclick his seatbelt. He cried out desperately for help and looked back in terror at the seat beside him. It was empty except for his leather jacket. There was no trace of the fiend who had been masquerading as a woman. The police found Bob wandering along the hard shoulder of the M62, and he gabbled out his bizarre tale, but was not believed. The police checked the club, and the management confirmed that Bob had left with a woman and that she had driven him home. Not one person at the club had any idea who Daniel was. Bob was badly shaken by the spine, chilling incident, and has never appeared at the Manchester Club since. Last summer, I got a job as a custodian at my former school. Having been established in the 1800s, the current building having been built in roughly the 1910s, you see some strange things working at night and even early morning. Within my first week, I spotted a shadow with white eyes hovering in the corner above the band room. I nicknamed him the Watcher because you can occasionally feel him in the room watching you. He does not like to be spotted, though. When I caught sight of him that day, I could feel that he was not happy about it, so I, of course, walked away. I have other paranormal and similar stories working where I do, including shadows roaming the halls at night, orbs of light, and others that need background to explain. It was mid-November, 2020. Wine and me and about ten friends were camping in the woods in the Sawtooth National Forest near Petit Lake. There were two groups of four people in two tents and one in a car, and me and my buddy, 
were in hammocks near the edge of the camp. It's about 1 a.m. and we all had been sleeping for about two hours. I wake up to my hammock mate panting extremely heavily and yelling my name. I am confused and get up and help him. He is paralyzed by fear. He said that he had an extremely vivid dream that there was a black figure tall and slender trying to break into his car after he had seen this figure decapitate me and the rest of his friends. He said that he woke up to the figure near the car and saw all of our heads stuck on sticks throughout the camp. He proceeded, he said, to click the car alarm button and the figure began to run circles around the car and the stop, then dashed off extremely quickly into the woods. I was obviously freaked out at this point and I immediately felt very uneasy, but I told him it was just a bad dream and that he needs to go back to sleep. Him and I tried for about five minutes, both stricken with fear at this point, when we hear our friend in the tent begin to yell, No, no, don't take me. Side note, we had not awoken anyone else in the camp at this point. This freaked me and my buddy out quite a bit because we had no idea what was going on. We were also very vulnerable in our hammock by ourselves, on the edge of our about 50 yard across camp. Our buddy's yells proceed to wake up most of the rest of the camp, and we find out that our friend in the car that my buddy said clicked the car alarm of was awake. So all of us scared and awake have a conversation about what is going on, and the buddy in the car says that he heard scratching on the window and heard something pull the door. He also said that he had seen the black figure running around the car as well. We were all freaked at this point and decided to move into the same tent. Our friend with a dream also claimed a similar murder story to the friend in the hammock. The next morning we all talked and so many of us experienced what happened that night, six in total, that we determined that it must have been some sort of being that was giving us nightmares. We called it a windigo, but we have no idea. Also, we had friends that stayed at the same site about six months earlier, and a few of them did notice weird things happening at camp at night, like feelings of being watched or feeling of a being walking around their tent. Strange stuff in the Idaho mountains. What does this sound like, and what do you all think? The weekend had finally arrived and my friends and I set out for a much needed camping trip in the remote woods of Harrington Forest. We had planned it for months and the excitement was palpable as we pitched our tents and settled in for the adventure. On our second day, while hiking through the forest, we stumbled upon a mysterious cave hidden beneath a thick canopy of trees. The entrance was almost obscured by tangled vines and overgrown foliage, making it seem as though the cave was beckoning us to discover its secrets. As the unofficial leader of our group, I suggested we explore the cave. It's not every day we find something like this, I said, my curiosity getting the better of me. My friends hesitated at first, but eventually agreed, and we decided to venture inside. We entered the cave cautiously, the darkness gradually swallowing us as we moved further in. The only light came from our headlamps, casting eerie shadows on the damp, rocky walls. The air was damp and musty, and the echo of our footsteps filled the narrow passageways. As we delved deeper into the cave, we felt an increasing sense of unease. It was as if something was watching us from the shadows, following our every move. We tried to shake off the feeling, telling ourselves it was just our overactive imagination. Our journey continued, and we discovered an expansive chamber filled with stunning stalactites and stalagmites. We marveled at the natural wonder, momentarily forgetting the unsettling feeling that had been plaguing us. It was then that we met Jack, the park ranger. He seemed to have appeared out of nowhere, but his presence was strangely comforting. Jack was an experienced ranger who knew the area like the back of his hand. He asked us about our intentions and warned us that this particular cave system was known to be treacherous and uncharted. Despite Jack's warnings, we were determined to push on. He agreed to guide us further into the cave, but only after we promised to follow his instructions carefully. As we ventured deeper, the oppressive atmosphere intensified. We felt a presence lurking in the shadows, and the sounds of our breathing and footsteps seemed to be amplified, 
as if to remind us that we were being watched. Jack led us to another chamber, this one filled with peculiar markings on the walls. They were unlike any cave drawings we had ever seen. The symbols seemed to tell a story of an ancient and powerful entity that had once inhabited the cave. As we stood there transfixed by the markings, we began to hear an unnerving sound. It was a low, guttural growl, echoing through the cavern, sending shivers down our spines. Jack's face turned pale as he whispered, We need to leave. Now. We didn't need any more convincing. We followed Jack back through the winding passages, but the growling grew louder and more menacing, as if the creature from the shadows was gaining on us. Our hearts raced as we scrambled through the darkness, desperately trying to escape the unseen terror. We finally saw the entrance to the cave up ahead, the sliver of daylight offering a beacon of hope. We managed to escape and never come back. I want to preface this by saying I know what I saw wasn't a skinwalker, but this is the most helpful supernatural thread I've seen. I've scoured multiple places on the internet and I still haven't figured out what I saw. The door to my bathroom is at the end of my hallway, so there's no possible way someone could have walked by, looked in, and then walked away, coming from the right of the door. Anyway, I was in the bath, and all the lights were off, save for the candle I had lit on the counter. I happened to look back down the hall, and in the right-hand corner, a pale white bald being looking at me. It had to be at least nine feet tall, because my ceiling is eight feet and it looked hunched over and was staring at me with its neck bent almost upside down. It looked kind of like Voldemort from Harry Potter, but tall and skinny. It was obviously gone when I looked back, but I haven't been able to figure out what it was. My partner suggested it was just a nine feet tall ghost. Ha-ha! But I don't think so. Any help or what direction to look in would be appreciated. Early one morning, my friend Joe took myself and another bud of mine, Alec, on a trip to the coast range. We'd done this a few times in the Cascades, but hadn't yet taken a trip to this one particular area, south of Corvallis, then west into the mountains via logging roads through an area where odd things have been reported in the past. Joe was aware of this. This specific road goes up a canyon that holds very few homes. Approximately one half mile above this last house was a turn where several trees blocked the road. Probably Tiber thieves. At any rate, we couldn't drive over it, plus it was early March and not too many roads, if any, had been cleared yet. It was raining, as it usually is that time of year, but we'd been driving for two hours and wanted to walk. We put on our hats and coats and just started walking in this road. I honestly remember thinking we were making a lot of noise. Approximately one half mile from the truck, we came around another tight curve in the road. At that point, my friend Alec stopped along the left side of the road, which ran fairly steeply down into a small ravine where a creek was at the bottom. Joe and I turned to Alec, who was looking at something along the side of the road. He told us to come back and look at something. We did, and what he had found startled us. It was a clear five-toed footprint of very big size. We couldn't believe it. The camera was in the truck. The rain was coming down, and we knew the clearness wasn't going to hold long. This is also how we knew the tracks were fresh. They were ringing with such detail it was obvious that we had spooked it up out of there. We'd been right on top of it. If we just hadn't have been talking and laughing it up, perhaps we would have seen whatever it was. Joe finally opted to go back to the truck to get a camera. Alec and I stayed there and literally watched the track dissolve with the rain. We couldn't tell where the beast had gone on up the hill. Lost the tracks once they hit the gravel on the road. So we backtracked and followed them quite a ways down the canyon. Most of the tracks were simply large impressions in the duff. The only one that was clear enough to totally see was the one Alec first spotted. Alec went back to the first track, and I started walking the timber back toward the general direction of the truck. I was basically walking with the road, only down in the brush. About thirty feet away from the tracks were a second set of smaller prints. 
that also came up out of the canyon and headed up to the road. I followed them up, and about ten feet short of the gravel, they cut to the right. This would have been right toward us. They cut, then straightened out, and we across the road at an angle. Then I lost them. About ten minutes later, Joe finally got back. We took peak cures, but as we had figured, the tracks were mere disturbances in the ground now. Nearly all of the detail was long gone, washed away. Only big foot-like outlines remained. While we were taking pics, Joe suddenly asked if we had heard anything. Without thinking twice, I said I had heard bird calls. Joe looked at me a long time, then said he'd heard bird calls back at the truck. There's a problem here. Birds don't call in the rain. The calls we heard were Amsat Crow, like only not, very loud. We were getting soaked, had been there over an hour by this point. So we went back to the truck and left. Later, when the pictures came back, we were very disappointed with the lack of detail. I had this old century house in Missouri where it had all of these outbuildings like barns, sheds, and a chicken coop. The whole place always felt weird, but especially the chicken coop. It was so bad my parents didn't even let me within 500 feet of the chicken coop. That area felt like hell and full of dread. What really set stuff off was when me and my cousin saw this skin color, naked humanish figure inside of the old chicken coop through the window. I saw this thing a few times, and it always seemed like it was pacing in there. Me and my whole family kept our good distance from that place, so I don't know if it ever noticed or cared about us. The farmhouse was built in Battlefield, Missouri, where a large battle from the Civil War took place, so I think this thing could have been a ghost or a spirit of a dead soldier. This can also be further evident by my aunt, who says there was the ghost of a boy wearing a Confederate uniform who was trapped in one of the bathrooms. This encounter happened many years ago when I was 15 years old. I only recently started reading information on the internet describing this creature, and now I have a desire to tell my story. This encounter happened at my grandparents' lake cabin south of the town of Danbury, Wisconsin, east of Highway 35, around Devil's Lake. My background has always been the great outdoors, playing and exploring in the woods. During this time period, I was very comfortable going out by myself for all-day adventures. On the night of this encounter, I had gone to sleep around 10 p.m. It was in the summer, so no school. This night was warm, so I had the bedroom window slightly cracked for some air circulation and to hear the crickets and outside noises. This always would put me to sleep every time because, like I said earlier, I was very comfortable in the woods and nothing was out of the ordinary that night. Now at the time, my grandparents' bedroom was on the other side of the cabin. They also had a black Labrador retriever that always slept in my room. Most of the time, this fact will come into the story later on. I had fallen asleep like I always did at this cabin. Hours later, I never knew exactly what time it was, but it was late and everyone was asleep. I suddenly awoke feeling something was wrong. Being still groggy, the first thing I noticed was that nothing outside was making any noise at all. No crickets, frogs, or poor wills. Nothing but total silence. I held my breath for a minute, listening very intently, thinking that was very odd. I moved my head to see the door of the bedroom. The night light from the hallway was giving a slight glow, and I could see that my grandparents' dog was not laying in his normal spot on the floor or any place in my room. I guess maybe two. Three minutes had passed, and then I heard it. A sound that to me sounded like a raccoon or some other animal scratching the outside of the cabin. This continued, and my mind wondered what the heck could have been making that noise. It was still totally silent, except that scratching noise that began to move down the wall, closer to the window of the bedroom. So I turned my attention to the window. It was very dark outside, but I could still make out the slight silhouette of the trees and the branches up high. All at once, the scratching stopped. I strained to adjust my eyes, and that's when it stepped out of the shadows and blocked out the view of the trees. It was huge. 
No animal I knew of or could envision was standing in my view. I couldn't make out any features of its body, but I could see the distinct ears of a canine on a large head. Then I saw its eyes and was paralyzed with fear. It was hunched down looking in the window. Its eyes were a glowing amber color and blinked every 10 to 15 seconds. My mind was racing. Can it see me? What's it going to do? What am I going to do? A chill went down my spine. I could hear it breathing. It let out an exhale that was deep, but not overly loud. Then it began to sniff the air. I could hear it clearly, only being around 10 to 12 feet away from it. About 30 seconds elapsed, which felt like forever to me. But looking back, it was not much time at all. The creature then began to show its teeth, almost like a grin of satisfaction that it had scared me so badly. Time stood still, then it stood up, off its haunches, erect like a man, and walked off, away from the window, in the direction of the lake. I knew this was my chance, so I jumped out of bed into the hallway, away from the window, and began to breathe heavy because I think I held my breath for over two minutes. I looked into the living room and could see the dog standing totally still, in a rigid posture, hair standing on end, with a slight growl looking at the deck window. I turned to the hall closet and grabbed my 20 gauge shotgun and loaded it. It was only a single shot, but it was better than nothing. I thought to myself while I was trying to catch my breath. Then I realized if it wanted to come into the house, it could easily do it by breaking the glass on the deck patio. If it did that, I'd, I had no place to go because I was trapped in between my bedroom and that patio window to my grandparents' room from where my grandfather had a deer rifle that I couldn't get to. I stood waiting for around five minutes and nothing happened. The dog seemed to calm down and walked over to me and sat down wanting to get his head scratched. I thought about waking up my grandparents and telling them what I had seen, but at the time, didn't think they would believe me. After all, I couldn't believe it myself, so I calmed down and went back into my bedroom, pulled the covers off the bed, and slept on the floor with a gun and dog, at the ready in a half-sleep for the rest of the night. This encounter had scared me so bad I didn't want to even get close to the window to close it all the way that night for fear of that thing coming back. I waited until dawn before I closed and locked it. Once daylight was in full force, I went outside to see if I could find any scratches on the wall or anything else, like footprints. I didn't find anything at all and was starting to wonder if I was going crazy. No, that thing was real. I continued to sleep on the floor for around a week before I felt it was okay to sleep in my bed again, but that window stayed closed and locked ever since. I didn't have any other encounters with a dogman after that incident, and the memory was put out of my mind over time until recently. I was reading encounters on your website and saw that two other people had an encounter in the same area as me. When I saw their encounters, I decided to share my experience. You don't know what true primal fear is until you see one of these things and are face to face with one. I never want to experience it again. Hey, folks, it took me some time, but I think I'm finally ready to share my encounter with you now. It happened in Western Germany, and what I'm about to share is the genuine truth. It all started with a horrible animal screaming sound outside my house at night, which I already compared to all wildlife animal sound records from zoology institutes, but nothing comes close to it. It kind of sounded like a woman screaming in agony, but then again even worse. It felt like I could feel the sound's vibration in my veins. It's hard to describe. It was really scary. I live in a tiny house next to forests, mountains. It was a dark October night and I laid in my bed, which is in a sleeping corner. Right in front is a window, which is always half opened, and above me is just a flat roof. Garden all around the house. At first I heard one animal a creature scream. Then there seemed to be two of them. They sounded very close and wouldn't stop screaming for minutes. The next thing I heard was something heavy running through the garden under my bed window, 
followed by heavy branches breaking at the height of my level. Sounded by heavy branches breaking at the height of my level, styling floor. I also heard a loud rush of air or wind combined to that. In the next second, this animal slash creature jumped on my roof. So in that moment, it was right above me, Kay, two, three meters. And that was the moment when things started to get messy and very confusing to me. Until this day, first I want to point out that this animal creature sounded so heavy when it landed. I don't know any animal species that big around here. It sounded massive and therefore surreal. Also, the quickness of its movement seemed surreal. After that jump, it started to run on my roof. From one side to the other, it first sounded like it was something extremely heavy on two legs, but that suddenly changed to what sounded like something extremely heavy. On four paws, I remember sitting straight up in bed right under it with an intense pulse and my mind just trying to process what I'm hearing. What kind of creature that is? That was also the turning point when I seriously felt threatened. Since I'm a girl living alone in a tiny house and didn't really have any protection to fight something massive like this off just knives or pepper spray, which quiet, sure, would have been useless. So I decided to do something stupid, I guess. I thought maybe I could shock it or scare it away, so I hit against my bed window with my flat hand as hard and loud as I could. What happened next messes with me until today, not even one second passed after I hit the glass when this creature hit it right back from outside. So, it must have been sitting right above me in that moment and reached down to my window, and it reacted so quickly, it was surreal. The sound of what touched my window glass sounded like a mix between big claws and feathers. This reaction and the way it sounded put me in kind of a shock, I guess. I realized I'm quiet screwed in that moment, because whatever it was, it was very intelligent huge and wouldn't back off. That's how it felt to me, as if it would say, you have no power here. I'm always one step further. Know your lane. Basically, I just froze then, on my bed, my back at the wall, and all I could to was starring it where it hit the window glass. I was too scared to close it. I was too scared to breathe even. Then it suddenly just left my roof, which sounded again like a massive weight would jump off in the air. I never shared this encounter before because I felt pretty alone with it. Until last night when I went on Reddit to look for someone from Germany who experienced something familiar and I was lucky. His post is today 24 days ago. He and his hunting buddy heard the same screaming sounds from a cow's field. Then they were chased for a short time by something but couldn't see it. Reading about his encounter made me want to step forward with mine as well. Since there are quite some confusing aspects or details to my encounter, it's a bit hard to find someone with a similar experience. So I genuinely hope that this post reaches someone who can relate and who'd be open to share his air, her experience as well. If you'd like to know more about my encounter, please feel free to ask everything you'd like, of course. I'm a rancher in Oklahoma. Pharrell hogs are a problem in this area. I live north of the Red River on the Oklahoma side, close to West Cash Creek. One night a friend called me to go pigs hunting with him on one of his friend's fields that is getting destroyed by pigs. Here in Oklahoma, it is legal to hunt pigs and coyotes with thermal scopes. Feral pigs are mainly active at night. We rode by the river, then walked possibly 150 yards and sat up behind a fallen log. We sat and waited. It was a beautiful, calm night, and moonlight made visibility excellent even without the thermal. After maybe 30 minutes, we heard this screaming. It was very loud. We looked at each other, thinking it was a possible cougar, but couldn't tell exactly where it came from. When we heard a pig squeal to our right, in my head, I was thinking a big cat caught a pig. I looked through my thermal. I froze. An eight to ten foot tall creature had this pig in its hands. It wasn't a small pig, maybe 200 to 250 pounds, and it was squealing and fighting the strength and size of this thing. It was amazing. 
It had a long beard, dog-like snout, and hairy. But in my thermal, the images are white, so as far as the color, I'm not sure. As I was watching this thing, it literally ripped the pig in half with its bare hands, like a sheet of paper, and threw it on the ground. It started walking towards us. I nearly crept myself. I literally froze. I couldn't pull the trigger. In my mind, I was telling my hand to pull the trigger, but I physically couldn't. Then, all of a sudden, a massive log, maybe thirty feet long, two to three foot round, flew over the top of us. I jumped up and ran. My buddy was right behind me. We got in my ATV. I started it and held my foot to the floor. We were traveling about sixty miles per hour. It'll run eighty miles per hour, but don't believe it was at top speed yet. We busted through the gate to the pasture. I didn't even have a thought of getting out and opening it. We hit a ditch and went airborne and started to do a front roll, thinking this is going to hurt. The next thing I remember, we were sitting still, not moving and not hurt. We were sitting next to my pickup and trailer. What the hell? We loaded it up and went to his house in silence. Not a word was said. We pulled up to his house. We went inside. His wife asked, What's wrong with you guys? You look like you've seen a ghost. Where are your guns? I said I think that it can keep the guns. I never even realized our guns were left laying by the stump, but I didn't care. I was glad to be out of there. I live about 40 miles from him. Now this is the creepiest part. When I parked the truck and walked to my front door, I noticed something in my yard. About 20 yards from the front door is that rifle I left down at the river. Holy crap! That thing knows where I live. It's 40 miles away. Nothing has happened since then, but I don't go out at dark unless I absolutely have to and haven't been back to that creek or river since, and I don't plan to, but I do feel something unnatural saved us that night. I'm FBI Agent Cade, and I have been assigned to investigate a string of disappearances in a remote national park. The disappearances have all occurred in the same area, and the victims have never been found. The locals believe that a cryptid is responsible for the attacks, and it's my job to investigate. I arrived at the park and began my investigation. I spoke to the locals and scoured the woods for any signs of the creature, but nothing came up, and I was starting to feel frustrated. One night, as I was walking back to my cabin, I heard a strange noise. It was a low growl, and it seemed to be coming from the woods. I hesitated, unsure of what to do, but I knew I had to investigate. As I walked into the woods, the sounds grew louder. I could hear twigs snapping underfoot, and the growling grew more intense. Suddenly, something lunged at me from the darkness. I didn't even have time to react. I hit the ground hard, and the creature was on top of me. I tried to fight back, but it was too strong. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It had long, razor-sharp claws, and its skin was mottled with green and brown. Its eyes glowed in the darkness, and its breath was hot against my face. I tried to reach for my gun, but it was too late. The creature's jaws closed around my neck, and I knew that I was done for. I could feel its teeth sinking into my flesh, and I knew that I had only moments left to live. But then something strange happened. The creature suddenly recoiled as if it had been burned. It let out a loud screech and ran off into the woods. I lay there gasping for breath and trying to process what had just happened. I managed to make it back to my cabin, but I was in bad shape. The creature had left deep wounds on my neck, and I knew that I needed medical attention. But more than that, I knew that I had to warn the others. I reported the incident to my superiors, and they sent a team to investigate. They found evidence of the creature, and I was hailed as a hero for surviving the attack. But even as I accepted their praise, I knew that something wasn't right. The woods were full of secrets, and I had just uncovered one of the darkest. I lived near some kind of a large forest, and I used to go on long bike rides alone at night there, just to have a moment for myself. The combination of absolute quietness and darkness is really unsettling, especially because even the slightest noise stands out. I took a different trail one time. 
In a few kilometers later, there was a fallen tree blocking the path. I lifted my bike over it and kept going. A while later, I heard wood cracking and saw not far off from the trail a tree falling. Note the F out of there. I work night shift. Three days ago, I came home, took my shower, and was sitting on the couch. I had a box fan in the downstairs window blowing cold air in. I live by an old cemetery in a small village next to a national park. I first thought something was wrong when the cats in the house were panic walking back and forth by the wall that's facing the cemetery. I watched them for a minute and I heard what sounded like crying coming from the cemetery area, and a soft helped me. I sat there and listened and heard it again a minute later. I quickly took the fan out of the window and closed and locked it and made everything else was locked. The past few days since then, I've been feeling like I'm being watched. When I got home yesterday, my ears were ringing the loudest I've ever heard it, and I heard a soft sob again. I waited in my vehicle for five minutes, then walked to the door. That's ten feet away. When I was opening the door, I thought saw something out of the corner of my eye, so I hurried up and closed the door behind me quickly and locked it. Once I was inside, the ringing immediately went away, but my cats were moving in a panicked manner again. I didn't know until recently that you aren't supposed to say the names out loud, as it draws their attention as does whistling at night. This is in Northeast Ohio. Thought? Ever since I was young, I have seen a large black wolf with red eyes. The first encounter I had with it was when I was 12. I was walking home from school in the mid-afternoon and was mostly zoning out. I used to bring my portable CD player to and from school and listen to CDs on my hour-long trek back home, so I didn't notice him at first. I had to trek through a large suburban area in order to get to my house on the far side of it from the school, but as I'm walking, I start to feel uneasy. I begin to look around and spot this wolf who stood as tall as I did at the time, five feet, and the only reason this is so ingrained into me is because I remember looking eye to eye with him. I was coming up a hill and about a block down on the corner of the road he was just standing there staring at me. My grandfather was a nine handler so I have been raised with dogs my whole life. I immediately went in to play it safe mowed like I would with a large, unfamiliar dog and averted my eyes because I didn't want it to think I was challenging it. My turn was thankfully on my left and the wolf out on my right, so I steadied my pace, reminding myself not to run. Running triggers the hunting instinct, and while I was still trying to wrap my head around the absolute massive size of this creature, I did my best to keep my eyes downwards, but at this point I was turning up my cold D sight, trying to keep it in view. I kept the paws in my sight as I cut across the road up towards my house. That was when they disappeared. I looked back knowing I shouldn't take my eyes off a stray animal, but he wasn't there. I kind of cursed myself mentally at the time. I think I was still in shock from the size that I hadn't processed that it was just a massive wolf in broad daylight. I remember chiding myself as I hurried into my house and closed or locked the door behind me. I lived in that house for a year afterwards and would frequently see him sitting in my backyard or in the field behind my six feet privacy fence, running in the unkempt space or staring directly up at my second story window. Then I moved from Colorado to Texas. I thought that would be the end of it, but I continued to see it. I was afraid at first of it, but over time grew used to catching sight of it. Most interactions were just catching him watching me. I never felt threatened, but he was always around. I've had multiple encounters where I wasn't the only one to see him either. I've had exes and my current spouse, then best friends see him at 15 on their parents. Almost 400 acres of property one night when we were having a sleepover. The next morning we went out to roam the fields. We found a dead cow who had been born apart, limbs scattered all over the pasture it was in. However, it wasn't supposed to even be there. There were no other cattle there. 
they were all over a mile away behind two, three closed fences. I would put more here, but app or phone are lagging due to length. I'm happy to answer questions or go more in depth on some of my encounters with him, but most of it is just this, watching from a far and dead animal showing up afterwards. I'm 30 now. I moved back to Colorado last year and I have seen him since the move, but the visit are fewer and farther between than they were in Texas, but I think part of that is because I live in a basement apartment now and try and limit my outside exposure due to C-19, I'm high risk and am not outside nearly as often. I'd love to find out just what it is he is, though. Maybe put my mind to rest. I'm sharing this story due to the request of another Redditor. This encounter took place in the winter of 2016 in Davies County, Indiana. It was around 8 o'clock and very dark outside. I was out feeding my goats. The goat shed was about 300 yards away from my home. To get to the shed, I had to cross two small fields and walk along a narrow path through the woods. These woods border an Indiana naval facility. After I had finished, I began to walk back. I had crossed one field and was about halfway through the narrow path when I started to hear rustling in the underbrush. All I had with me was a little flashlight that only shined about ten feet in front of me. I was almost to the end of the path when I spotted something. It was on all fours with a bony frame, elongated limbs, and pale skin. While the first part of that description sounds pretty generic, it did seem to have a long and highly flexible neck. Not long after I noticed it, it noticed me and bolted down the path. It ran almost scuttling into the second field. This field had a small hill in the center. This thing fled and disappeared over one side. I ran as fast as I could around the other side of the small hill and zigzagged back to my house, where I quickly locked all of my doors. This thing was terrifying, but it seemed watchful more than anything, for now. I'm a female, and this occurred two years ago when I was 18. This takes place in Maine. Every summer, my family and I go up to camp in Dedham Ellsworth, Maine. It's about a three-hour drive from my house. The camp itself is about an hour from the nearest town. I've been going to this camp my entire life. My family owns it, and I've never had an incident like this happen before. I was watching TV in the middle of the night. Both of my brothers and my parents had gone to bed. I heard a noise coming from the kitchen and realized that the dogs needed to go outside to do their business. So I took my brother's two pit bulls and my effin pincher, tiny dog, outside after turning on the porch light. I walked around to the front yard and I let the dogs off leash. It's so incredibly dark in the woods in Maine that the porch light really only illuminated the porch and nothing else. So I tried to keep an eye on them. I was momentarily distracted when I saw a loon, wild bird, on the lake. When I looked back, I saw that the pit bulls were both looking at something in the woods. I couldn't see what it was, but I assumed they'd seen a squirrel or a raccoon. It was then that I realized I didn't see Alfie anywhere. She's an awfully small dog, and she's completely black. I called for her a few times and heard some soft whimpering right where the dogs had been looking earlier. I took a couple steps in that direction and called for her again, worried that she may have gotten her paw stuck between the rocks or gotten stuck in a snake hole. Suddenly I felt something moving behind me. I whipped around and looked down, and it was Alfie. She'd been staying close to me the whole time. I just hadn't seen her. So naturally I was thinking, if Alfie is here, WTF is in the woods. I took another step forward and the pit bulls began to growl. They were slowly advancing and were now on either side of me, looking right into the blackness of the woods. I quickly picked up Alfie and began to back up very slowly. I'm not sure what I thought was there, but there are lots of animals in Maine, and I figured the dogs knew better than I did, since I couldn't see anything. Right as I turned around, I heard the most absolutely bone-chilling thing I've ever heard in my life. Coming from the direction of the woods, I heard something someone call Alfie's name. 
It sounded almost as if it was trying to mimic me, but it was just all wrong. The voice sounded really distorted, and it almost seemed to wail. I freaked the F out and ran inside with the dogs. I have no idea what was out there in the woods. My camp is essentially a log cabin overlooking a lake, and our nearest neighbor, who is also family, lives at least a half mile in the opposite direction of where the thing was. What do you guys think? A few things to know. I share custody of my son with his father. It is 50-50. When my son was younger, I would wake him up at the crack of dawn to get him ready for daycare before I went into work. I've worked remotely for three years now and no longer have to wake up so early. I also love to talk to my kids about their memories. What's your happiest memory? What's your favorite memory with your brother? What's your earliest memory? As I think talking about their memories helps keep them alive in their minds, and I love to see the world through their eyes. A few months ago, when my son was six, he told me he remembered what it was like to be in my belly, that it was dark, wet, warm, and comforting. At the time, I didn't think much of it and just nodded and told him that I thought that was interesting. Fast forward to a month ago, I asked my now seven-year-old what his earliest memory was. I will do my best to describe what he described to me. He was three years old at the time. He was sleeping and woke up in a dark room. He didn't know where he was, but he stayed in his bed and visually observed the room. He described the room to me, which was spot on. We moved out of that house two years ago. He said at the time he didn't know where he was, but he wasn't scared. When the sun started coming up and brightening his room, I, his, his mother came in. He saw me and didn't know who I was, but again, was not scared. I asked him if he remembered his dad when he picked him up, and he said no. He didn't recognize his dad, his dad's house, or his own bedroom there. He said from that day he awoke in his room at my house, and going forward was when he began to learn. He said prior to the day he woke up, he couldn't see through his eyes. The way he describes it to me seems like the way you see in a dream. He struggled to explain this portion to me. He said it wasn't a scary feeling when he was finally able to see. At the time he was explaining this to me, his four-year-old sister was wandering around the house playing by herself, and he looked at her and said, I wonder if she remembers when she could see. I believe what he was describing to me was the moment his consciousness came to him. The moment he realized he was here on this earth. The way he explained it in such great detail makes me believe that this is an actual memory and not something he has made up. Does anyone have a similar experience? I had been working as a park ranger for over a decade, but nothing could have prepared me for the events that would unfold in the remote national park I patrolled. It was a typical day when I received a distress call from a group of hikers who had gone missing. They were well-equipped, experienced hikers, so I knew something was amiss. I immediately set out to find them. As I hiked through the dense forest, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was watching me. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my heart raced as I heard rustling in the bushes. I tried to tell myself it was just a wild animal, but deep down, I knew something was wrong. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the feeling of unease only grew stronger. It was as if the forest was alive and it didn't want me there. I pressed on, determined to find the missing hikers, but the trail soon became difficult to follow. I could see signs of a struggle and my heart sank as I realized the hikers might be in grave danger. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon a makeshift campsite. Tents were ripped open and backpacks were strewn about as if someone or something had ransacked the campsite. The hikers were nowhere to be found and I knew I had to act fast if I wanted to find them alive. As I searched the surrounding area I heard strange noises coming from the trees. It sounded like a low growl but it was unlike anything I had ever heard before. I drew my weapon prepared to defend myself but the creature that emerged from the trees was like nothing. I had ever seen before. It was a large humanoid creature with matted fur and razor-sharp claws. It was clearly intelligent, 
and as it bared its teeth at me, I knew it was hunting me. I fired my weapon, but the creature seemed unfazed. It charged toward me, and I knew I had to run. I ran as fast as I could, but the creature was right behind me. Its hot breath was on my neck, and I could feel its claws scraping against my skin. I stumbled, and it was all over. The creature pounced on me, and I knew I was going to die. But as the creature loomed over me, something strange happened. It stopped as if it had suddenly lost interest. It looked up towards the sky and let out a deafening roar before disappearing back into the forest. I was left shaken and confused, but I knew I had to find the missing hikers. I eventually found them, alive but traumatized. They told me stories of a creature that had been stalking them through the woods, but I knew they wouldn't be believed if they shared their experiences with the world. I made sure they got the medical attention they needed and escorted them back to civilization. But the memory of that creature still haunts me to this day. I've never seen anything like it before, and I hope I never have to encounter it again. The woods may be beautiful and serene, but they're also full of mysteries and dangers that we may never fully understand. This happened between 1986 and 1989. My uncles and cousins lived in Lamy, an area in the extreme south of Porto Alegre, Brazil. My uncle, now deceased, had a small Botico Brazilian restaurant in that region, and at that time the nearest neighbor was more than a kilometer away. Pasture and centenary trees predominated the landscape. To serve the region, there were two buses in the morning and two more in the early evening. At that time, there were rumors that a very large animal with the body of a man and the head of an animal had been seen nearby and it was said that it attacked both animals and people. Several people claimed to have been attacked by this monster and luckily escaped. Others swore they had lost an ox or two to the creature. My aunt, very skeptical and dedicated to her children and day-to-day -day chores, did not like to pay attention to these inventions of the people, as she said. However, one day her disbelief was put to the test. She and one of my cousins were returning home by bus already in the dark of night. Less than ten people were on the bus, when in a certain part of the journey, something very large came out of the bush and hit the right side of the bus and returned to the bush. The crash caused the driver, perhaps out of fright, to lose control and break sharply, stopping partially in a ditch. Despite the scare, there were no injuries, but people were very scared by that event. The driver got very irritated and left the bus mumbling and cursing, going to check the damage and at the same time calling for help. Being in the dark and still a long way from home, everyone stayed in their places. A few minutes after the driver left, everyone heard a strange grunt, which could not be from an animal or human being, according to the witnesses. People panicked and started crowding right next to the conductor's chair. Silence took over the people. Everyone was attentive to all external sounds when, without warning, a new knock was given on the same side of the bus. Everyone got up and ran to the other side. Some of the people began to cry and pray. One lady became out of control, and my aunt, very afraid, remained to protect her son. At that moment, the bus began to be violently shaken, as if something or something was shaking the vehicle from side to side. The dread grew as the bus rocked. It looked like it would be overturned at any moment. Looking through the windows, you could see a large figure outside, but you couldn't tell what it was. Without the slightest warning, everything stopped, and whatever was causing it started to make its way toward the front of the bus, where the door was open. At that moment, my aunt was so terrified that she wanted to die and not see what was attacking them. Even before the creature entered the bus, it was possible to smell a terrible, rotten, unbearable smell. Everyone fled to the back of the bus and huddled in a corner, which made them look like a single, shapeless mass of people huddled together. Those who had the courage to look swear to have seen a large, naked man with dark skin, a huge goat's head with huge horns and yellow eyes, who ran to the turnstile and stopped. He spent a few seconds straining and huffing angrily before turning around, getting off the bus and disappearing into the bushes. 
unbridled crying took over people. People were in shock, totally terrified. A few long minutes passed when another bus pulled alongside this one. Another driver, who was called to help the damaged bus, was informed of what had happened and left to find the first driver, who had not yet returned. Luckily, he was walking along the side of the road, returning from the place he called the bus company. The military brigade was activated, and ambulances, experts, radio, and television came. The case was covered for a few months with newspaper articles and interviews with the victims. Search parties searched for the creature's tracks, but they were never found. Several theories were formulated about what would have attacked the bus, but nothing is proven. Apart from some dead animals which were attributed to the creature, nothing else happened. Nowadays, that region is populated and very different from the time when the events occurred, leaving the mystery of the creature that attacked the bus I lived in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and worked in Palmerton. I worked the late shift so I'd get out of work at 10 p.m. One night as I was heading home late because of overtime, I think it was about one a mile, I was driving down the road at the above coordinates. I saw two red dots of light from far away, but they seemed to be approaching my car very quickly. I slow down and suddenly these massive, battered, dragon-like leather wings come gliding with a single flap motion just over my car. It was so surreal and happened extremely quickly, but I didn't see its face or body detail. It was a new moon and there's only my headlights out there. I slammed on the brakes and get out, but it's just total darkness and this thing was black. I'd say its wingspan was about 10 or 11 feet. I've seen a condor before, and it was pretty much that size, just massive, but I could hear it flying away after I stopped and got out. There was just no moonlight, so I couldn't see it, but it sounded like when you spread a sheet out on a bed or throw a tarp over something. I've only told three people this story, but I figure I might as well post it somewhere so people can try to get a pick or something. It'd be cool to see it again. Edit. Writing this post helped me consider any alternative explanations, and I'm willing to consider this as a possibility since it was so fast a sighting. It just seemed larger than five feet, but I didn't have anything nearby to gauge size with. The wings also could have looked leathery because of the reflection of my headlights on preened black vulture wings, which lacked the white flight feathers of turkey vultures. It would also explain why the red eyes were near the road and then flew above my car. I'm really not into hiking because I'm a very cautious person and I do my best to keep my friends out of trouble. But that's where my issue was. I ended up going with my friends along this trail so I could keep them from doing irrational, impulsive things. Anyhow, I come to a crossing where there was a rope bridge. Major no-no in my books, but my friends insisted upon crossing. I told them to pick up this small granite boulder and chuck it on the bridge to prove my point. They did it and it didn't collapse, so they started crossing. Unfortunately, I was the last one to cross, and when I was about three-fourths way across the bridge, it collapsed and I fell all about twenty-something feet. I was crazy lucky because I had offered to take most of my friend's sleeping bags and I had strapped them all over me to carry them comfortably because they're much stronger than I am. I landed and blacked out, but I managed with only five broken ribs and a dislocated shoulder as well as a small hairline fracture in my radius. The worst part for me, though, was all of the animal carcasses at the bottom of the crevice. I was just starting my vet studies at the time, and the mutilated bodies were so grim. They were the first things I saw when I woke up, and some of them were fresh. My legs landed on a dog, and there was a fawn a few meters away from my face. I was so sore and couldn't move because I was afraid that I might have been paralyzed, and all I could do was cry. My best friend heard me and shouted down, and I tried to scream to him. Thank God that rescue was called almost immediately, and... I was lifted out. It's safe to say that my friends now take my intuition as law.
About a month ago, my boyfriend and I were on the couch of our home watching a scary movie around 9 p.m. He has two phones, his personal cell and his work phone. Once we finished the movie, I said I was going to get the shower going and wait for him to join me after he called his daughter to tell her good night. He used his personal phone to call her, leaving his work phone on the couch alongside his personal one once he hung up. He came to check on me in the shower and told me he would be in after he grabbed some clothes and a towel. However, after going back to the bedroom to grab those, he noticed that his personal phone was missing from the couch. He was only gone for about a minute from the living room to come to the bathroom. He spent another five minutes looking for it everywhere in the house, even tried calling it from his work phone several times before giving up and getting into the shower with me. About 30 minutes pass, he tells me about the incident, and we think nothing of it since I promised to help him find it after we get out. However, once we get out, we spend another five minutes tearing the house apart. Still nothing. He and I both called his personal phone several times, but we couldn't hear it anywhere. I finally have the idea to try and ping it, using the shared location services. That's when it shows up. Claiming to be in the neighbor's front yard, he thought I was joking with him until I showed him my screen. Neither of us had left the house, both the front door and the back door still remained locked from. When we got home earlier that day, I thought he was actually the one pranking me. He promised he wasn't. I stood in the doorway as he got a jacket on and went outside with his work phone using it as a flashlight and to call his personal phone. He looked for it for a while, but then I watched as he bent down, dug in our neighbor's bushes, and retrieved his flashing personal phone that lit up due to the incoming call. It had been raining and was very muddy, yet his phone was completely dry and seemingly untouched when he retrieved it. As he called it, the phone didn't make any sound, just buzzed. Yet when he double-checked that he kept the ringer on, thinking it got turned off, it was still on, as it should have been playing his ringtone, but it never did that entire time we looked for it. We cannot explain how it got outside in the span of about five minutes. Never rang even with the ringer on. Was still dry after sitting in the rain or mud for about forty minutes total, and how it ended up buried in the neighbor's bushes. Edit. I didn't want to make a separate post, so I, I, I thought I'd add on. Ever since this incident with the phone, more strange things have happened. Things have been knocked over in the middle of the night. I hear footsteps when I'm home alone, see things out of the corner of my eyes, and the scariest one yet. We have light fixtures that you click on and off, like flat buttons, not the switches. He and I were sitting on the couch in the living room when all of a sudden the lights in the dining room began to turn on and off. The creepy part was that the buttons were being clicked rapidly and loudly too. I would have chalked it up to faulty wiring if it was just the lights going crazy, but the buttons were physically being pressed and making noise too, as if someone was pressing it on and off very quickly. He said he has never experienced anything like this in this house before. It started happening after I moved in. After reading some comments, I'm beginning to think it's some sort of entity. It might be attached to me. I've had other paranormal experiences before, too. I was walking my dog, a black and white pity retriever mix, outside before putting him to bed around 11 p.m. It's very dark, as there's a lot of wooded areas around my apartment complex. I usually walk him about half a mile or so out from the complex to a stop sign and light post at the end of the street, which borders on the woods. Usually there is nothing out of the ordinary, just woods and uh, normal animals like squirrels and the occasional deer. Sometimes there's that weird, heavy feeling like something is watching you intently, but I honestly ignore it and we cut our walk short and head home since a brief scan of the area shows nothing is there. Tonight there was that heavy, watched feeling again, but when I scanned the woods there was something there. A dog with glowing yellow eyes that looked exactly like my dog, down to the heart-shaped white spot on his chest, standing just past the tree line, staring directly at us. It looked like it could be his twin, but there was just something off about it that invoked that feeling of run. My dog definitely saw it too and was whining and staring at it hard. 
Usually, my dog is reactive to other large dogs, but he seemed more scared than anything else and wanted to get away, which is very abnormal behavior for him. After seeing it, I fought that run feeling and walked quickly but casually back into the gated area and home, without looking back but listening very hard for anything coming behind or to the sides of us. Instinctively, it felt like the safe thing to do. I don't know why. It seemed like it didn't follow, but who knows. I do know that I will be skipping nighttime walks for a while, that's for sure. Any ideas on what that might have been? Google was not much help. We live in North Georgia at the base of the Appalachians, but I didn't grow up here, so I'm not sure of local folklore for the most part. I didn't hear this, but my mother did. My mother's sister and I had taken a trip to Oregon to see my dad in the summer of 2002. He lives in Parkdale, Hood River, Oregon, and there is a lot of forested areas around his place. The three of us were in the camper one night, very tired from driving. My mother was, for some reason, awake and laying in the bed. About three in the morning, my dad's peacocks and ducks and gucks and guinea hens started freaking out and making loud noises. My mom wondered why they were doing this. She figured there was a fox or something in the hen house. But then everything became quiet, and in the not too far distance she heard this yelling and screaming. She laid in the bed, listening for a few minutes, and every animal she knew went through her head. She used to work in a zoo, so she knows quite about about animals. Every animal that went through her head had no sound like that. The screaming went on for a little bit, and then sounded further and further off. She finally fell asleep and told me about it when I woke up that morning. I had chills going down my back because a few years before that night I used to come to my dad's every summer. One night I was in a dead sleep and my dad's dog started growling and barking. He slept in a kennel right next to me. And after my mom told me about that night I thought of the dog barking. What if Bigfoot was looking at me? Through the window! Just nights before my mother heard this, we had been driving up into Oregon. I was driving and my younger sister was in the passenger seat. Both of us saw a huge black figure walk across the road just at the end of our headlights. When we passed it, I looked at my sister just to make sure she saw it too. Moments later, my mother made me stop and get out so she could drive. I was of course afraid to do this for the nine-foot man that just walked across the road. I lived in New York around the time that Ralph Bucky Phillips was on the run. He was a fugitive who had killed at least one police officer. At any rate, I was out for a hike near my old farmhouse and came across a recently vacated campsite. It still had recently purchased canned goods, tent, and sleeping bag, though nobody was around. I get stupidly fearless when I should know better sometimes and peered into the tent, but there was nobody around as far as I could see. I got the creep strongly and headed back, not going directly home, zigzagging in case I was being followed. Whether or not it was him, odds are it was probably just some squatter who was hiding from me themselves, not wanting to get caught on private land. It was still horrifying to have it slowly dawn on me that I was alone in what was basically somebody's home, and they could do whatever they wanted. To about that. Another time, different place. My friend and I were exploring some disused and abandoned underground mines in our state. The way it is set up, you have to pass through a main room when you first go in. It is sort of open to the outside, but also sheltered. If that makes sense, it branches out into several veins that go underground and become pitch black. Totally zero percent visibility in there without a flashlight. So we chose the usual route. We had been in there several times already, and had a usual route, lull, and explored for a few hours. It became time to head back. We reached the main room, and there is a fresh, large pile of human feces right in our path to get out. It was most definitely not there when we entered, and we remained close together at all times, so I knew that my friend hadn't done the shit. We had to really stretch to avoid stepping in it. 
We managed to avoid it totally, but how disgusting. And as we passed the stone hallway that led to another branch of the mine, we saw some sort of light way down there where it opens into a larger, totally black room. My guess is that we interrupted a squatter who did not want to be seen, but also did not want to just allow some twenty-something weirdos to traipse all around their territory, and they took the shit to make a statement. We actually called out, hey, if someone hears this and is staying here, we meant no harm, and didn't do anything to destroy your home, because we are considerate like that. During 1999, I worked briefly as a vacuum cleaner salesman. Yes, the job was as terrible as it sounds. Now, which required very late nights, as I was often at customers' homes till around 9 p.m., before having to go back to the head office to check out, then drive back home, often not arriving home until 12, 1 a.m. I was working late this one particular night and was on the home stretch around 10 minutes from home, when my old crappy cheap Ford Fiesta started to overheat. I knew the car wouldn't make it home and had no choice other than to pull into a lay-by on top of the big dark deserted mountain next to my town. My hometown is literally the last town, before there are just mountain and forest for countless miles. As I pulled into the mountain parking area with steam pouring my engine, this is 100% true by the way, a white humanoid figure obviously surprised that a car was pulling into a deserted parking space in the middle of the night, ran directly front of my headlights as it sprinted from the edge of the clear side of the parking area and into the forest on the other side. It had no clothes, features, genitals, and hair, etc. Just a white figure with two arms and two legs that appeared almost luminous and reflective in my lights. To say I shit myself is a bit of an understatement. My eyes popped out of my sockets when it ran in front of me, but then I realized that I was stuck in a dead car in a deserted mountain lay by in the middle of the night with no mobile phone signal. As this was back in the days when mobile phones were just starting to become popular, but large chunks of the country were missing from network coverage, I had no choice but to sit there for around an hour until my car cooled down as it gave up the ghost pretty much the second I pulled in. So I sat in my car, alone, staring directly into the forest where the thing I saw had run. No weapon, no way to contact anyway to let them know where I was and no passing traffic to possibly flag down. During my wait in the car, I obviously started to wonder what I had seen. I knew for a fact that I had actually seen something, and it was not a trick of the light. That much was clear. I discounted sheep, horses, foxes, or any other animal that populated the Welsh mountains, as I was certain, in a two-legged humanoid creature shape, with roughly human head, body, arms, and legs proportions. The obvious answer would have been that it was some very strange man who, for some reason, was wearing a white entire body stocking. Think Charlie's Green Man, and it's always sunny, but since we were miles away from the nearest home, and I was the only car around, it's highly unlikely that someone would have spent hours walking through thick forests just to hang out at a parking area in the middle of a forest wearing a unitar. Since I could rule out possible animals or humans, I had to consider the alternative, which isn't a nice thing to think about, when you are stuck in a broken-down car with this creature very possibly still outside. I didn't think it was aliens as it was too tall compared to the classic look, while any type of apparition or ghost doesn't tend to run away from people when surprised. I'm not sure if there is some kind of Welsh version of a Wendigo, but if I had to categorize the encounter, this would be my number one choice. There was always talk of satanic rituals and witches practicing in the forest when I was a kid, and also of illegal bare-knuckle fights where people had been killed and buried there to cover up the crime, but I didn't think much of it at the time, and always wrote it off to superstition and rumor. But now I'm not so sure. Eventually my car cooled down enough for me to limp back home, 
No one really believed me when I told them what I saw and are adamant that it was a sheep, but to this day I will swear that the creature I encountered was something different. I have been in the forest many times since camping, biking, and hiking, and have never seen anything like that again. But whenever I go there, I am always aware of the possible presence of the goatman. I'd been hiking in Wikiwa State Park since it's literally across the street from my house. I was somewhere on the Orange Trail. I really hadn't seen anyone cause it was chilly. I started hearing laughter from the scrub about 20 yards to my left. It made me a bit nervous considering there was nobody to make the noise, but I continued on. Probably two more minutes pass and I hear it again, this time a bit closer. I picked up the pace. Less than a minute later I heard it for a third time followed by substantial movement coming out of the brush behind me. I didn't look, I just ran. I ended up sucking wind, maybe half a mile down the trail. I couldn't keep going. I ended up facing the direction of the creepy noises and taking a knee to rest. As I was turning back around to continue my hike out, I found a packet containing three sharp knives. I shut myself. Everything after that is a blur. I told a ranger at the front as I left. It didn't seem like an urgent matter to them, so I just left it. I have no idea what it was, or what it could have been. I just know I didn't want any part of it. I have one other creepy story from when I was a kid. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.